this part. Why not? All right. So uh, today uh, we will be starting on Mongoose Movies Crud. Uh, and then we will be moving uh, into um, our uh, embedding using the same application that we are uh, going to be using here. Uh, we're just going to be adding in a layer to it, and then we'll move into referencing next Tuesday. Uh, so that's kind of our schedule for this. Uh, I will see how far we get. I'm not going to like push us to the metal, just to get stuff done. Um, but we'll, you know, a, a lot of what we're doing today is review. It's stuff that we have seen in this last week, and we're just getting in another rep on kind of setting up a um on, on setting up a express app uh and looking at all of these components that make up our apps once again. So um that's kind of what we are going to be doing uh today. Um let me do one quick thing real quick. Um just remember I made a change that we we're going to want in our lecture. So um, today, uh, basically what we will be doing is going through what we have done this week. Um, that's kind of the goal for today. We're doing the things that we've done previously just in a new application. Um, so it, this is today is really just a rep of everything that we've done this week. It's going to all be combined into uh, this one place. So um, that's kind of how this is going to look um we are going to um be doing this uh work and we'll kind of talk about some project things as well we'll layer that in on top of this uh kind of some expectations for how your projects are going to go um that kind of stuff so uh let's go ahead and this um okay cool so just removing a little bit of junk from this lecture and then we will start okay um uh, let's go ahead and jump in so our setup for this is going to be a little bit different um the app that we were building today is going to have all of the kind of starter code already built and done for us. Uh, so we are going to have a, a little bit of, uh, this is basically the Egen replacement app, uh, but it is essentially going to be um, for us to be able to uh, not have to copy down a bunch of CSS as we're going. Uh, we will simply start with that finish CSS and we will uh, then be able to just kind of implement it in our applications. So uh, let's go ahead and do our setup. We're going to need to be in our lectures directory. So move into your lectures directory and you're going to want to run this command that is right here. I'm just going to copy this from right out of the lecture. Put it in here. And you'll see that this is going to clone down a project to your machine called Mongoose Movies. So before we go any further, let's look at what we actually have here. And like I said, this is basically an application uh, that is built with the Egen replacement app that we've been kind of building to do's off of as we've been uh, going this week. Uh, we have that kind of same idea here to start with. The only real difference that we have is that we have these style sheets that are already going to be part of this project. So it's really, really easy for us to just add this in. So this is, uh, we'll see this kind of throughout uh, our work in this uh our work here and that is uh we'll reference these css files and walk through them whenever it is appropriate uh but we won't actually be writing any css ourselves for these apps 
that is not something I want to like get lost on focusing on here. Um, if we have questions as, on this stuff as we see it, we will talk about it. Uh, but for the most part, we will basically kind of just be uh, going through our application and linking up these CSS files as we go. Um, I think I saw a hand go up. Did someone have a question? Yes, I did put my hand up and I put it back down. I <laughs> was just going to ask you to pause for a second because I wanted of to create a private repo on my Git so I could write. It was just taking me a moment and I was worried oh, okay. you were going to get ahead of me. Oh, no, 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 no. We'll, we'll keep doing this for a hot minute. Don't worry. <laughs> cool. So um, like I said, CSS is uh all going to be here already but besides that this is basically just an application built with uh the express generator replacement that we've got so um nothing wild or crazy happening here just uh you know something to kind of be aware of as to why we're cloning down this mongoose movies thing instead of our agent replacement this is basically the same just has those style sheets all right so um First thing that we need to do whenever we clone down a uh, repo is we have this package.json here. And this has our dependencies in it. We have this dependencies object. So whenever we clone down any project that's up on uh, GitHub that has this package.json, the very first thing that we're going to want to do is run MPMI. If I don't run MPMI here and I just instead run Nodemon, we are going to get an error. Cannot find package HTTP errors. So, because we can't find this name package, this means that we don't have this item out of this dependency array. We don't have HTTP errors. So we need to go and get it. And we do that by running NPMI. All right, and now next, what we're going to do is set this up so that you're able to pull down my code at any time using those same commands that you're familiar with. Right now in our Git repo, if we do uh, git remote dash v, you'll see that we have an origin. So whenever you try to reset to upstream main, there is no upstream here. Uh, we also kind of want to keep our origin as something that we are able to push to, that we can kind of uh, hook up here. So um, what we're going to want to do is remove this origin that already exists here, but then re-add it as an upstream. So then you can use these same familiar commands that we've been using before. So we're just going to copy this out of here. This command removes the origin remote and it adds a new upstream remote that is realistically pointing at the same exact repo. If we do get remote dash V, we're going to see that we now have an upstream set to mongoose movies. Um, Callum. Uh, can I just confirm that like that action step isn't fundamentally doing anything. It's just renaming it. Like Correct. origin yep. and upstream are just aliases, right? Exactly. Yep. Okay. Yep. Yep. Hundred um, percent. I will say, kind of convention around this though is that origin should be something that you have control of. That is something that you own. Uh, it is the origin for your code. Um, so in this case, you don't own the SEI remote repo. You can't push to it or anything like that. So therefore, it makes sense to have this be the upstream instead. Um, but that being said, all of that is just convention. There's functionally nothing tied to these aliases of origin or upstream. Super helpful. Thank place. you. Of course. Great question. Cool. All right. So let's go ahead and jump into Mongoose Movies. So... Um, Mongoose movies. We have a few kind of new concepts that we're going to cover as part of this. Uh, and we've previously talked about this in uh, our last unit just a little bit. We touched on it. Um, we have these user stories. 
And whenever you all are working on your applications, you're going to have these same things. You're going to have user stories whenever you're building your unit project. These are really going to be the pseudo code for this unit. And these user stories are going to describe the pieces of functionality that we want to implement. And you'll see that our user stories will typically revolve around CRUD and CRUD actions. So if we read this, our first user story, as a user, I should see a form to add a movie on the add movie page. And you'll also see that we're describing kind of the shape of our data, our schema that we have in here. We say, I should be able to log the title, the release year, the MPAA rating, and click a checkbox to indicate whether or not the movie is currently showing. So this user story that we've written here is doing a couple different things. It is telling us, hey, I'm going to need a view where I can see this form to add a movie on an add movie page. And I, as the user, should be able to enter this information, the title, the release year, the MPA rating, and whether or not the movie is currently showing. So our user story is informing both the schema of a movie and my CRUD action here, or in this case, a view that will initiate some CRUD action. And again, the reason for this is that you're writing this from the perspective of the user. You're writing this from a perspective of, I would like to have this functionality in this application. Your user doesn't necessarily care about CRUD. They don't have to think about creating, reading, updating, and deleting. Before you all took this course, you didn't think of those things as users either. You just thought, oh, I'm going to go and make a post on Facebook. Not like, oh, I'm doing this action in a database where I am going to create a post on Facebook and it's going to be sent to this server where that server is going to create an entry in a database. You're looking at these user stories from the perspective of someone who is using your application. So that's our first user story. You'll see here that in this application, we are creating first before we implement our next thing, reading. And we've got this abbreviation, AAU. This is an abbreviation for as a user. So as a user, I should be able to go to a page called all movies and see all the movies. And then from that page, from that movie index page, I should be able to click on a link and see all the movie details on a new page. Also on our all movies page, I should be able to delete a movie from that page. And then from the movies details page, I should be able to edit the details of a movie by clicking on a button on that page. These are the user stories that we are going to implement today. And again, I want you to get out of this, that these user stories are describing CRUD. So whenever we intro the project to you and we kind of out and we lay out the project requirements, um, one of those requirements is that your application that you build has full CRUD somewhere within its features. So by looking at your user stories that you will write for your project, we should be able to tell that you are going to implement full CRUD in your application. That is what we were able to see here. I have the ability to edit, delete a movie as a user. I have the ability to edit the details of a movie as a user. I have read actions as a user. And I have the ability to add a movie as a user. I have full CRUD on this movie's resource. I can get those details just by looking at these user stories.
Any questions about that? Cool. Very good. All right. So again, those are going to be kind of the first thing that you do as part of your project planning is determine what your user stories are, um, along with building wireframes, which we'll also see as we work on this application. But what we're going to do first is work on um, our model. And we've kind of already hit on this idea. We've implemented this before. We are going to build out a model file. In that file, we will define a schema, compile it into a model, and then export that model from the model file. Again, this is all kind of review stuff. We've only done it at this point a couple of times, though. So uh, we are going to kind of go through that whole process again. Uh, I'm going to skip these review questions because I know you all know this. Um, so to be able to do this, first thing that I need in my application is Mongoose. I need to be able to use Mongoose to build a schema. So, and ultimately a model. So I'm going to NPMI Mongoose. You'll see that it gets added to our dependencies object that we have here in our package.json. And now what I'm going to do is, remember, we need to uh, interact with our database. We need to have a connection string that we can uh, use inside of a .env file. So I'm going to touch a .env file. I now have this. And we've talked about this before, but all I need to do to be able to hook up to a database now now that I have built out an application, is my previous connection string that I was already using. So back in my terminal, I'm going to move into my lectures directory, and I'm going to swing into express to do's. Because I know we have a database that was set up and working there yesterday, I can do that same thing today. Open this in VS Code, open my .env file, and just copy this from right out of here. Paste it over here. So again, I'm in my express to do's directory that is inside of my lectures directory. I've opened this up in VS Code. I've opened the .env file here. I've copied the entire contents of this file. And then I swung back over to my uh, other application, my Mongoose Movies app, and I pasted in that connection string. All right. And what is the thing that I need to replace in this connection string so that I can connect to a different database? So I've made a new database for this project. Uh, yeah. slash to do's exactly yes so here instead of slash to do's i'm going to have slash movies and again this is basically the same process that you're going to go through as you build all of your projects out for the realistically almost rest of this course at least this unit and next unit Copy this database URL from an existing project or a saved document or wherever you have this saved, paste it in the new thing that you were building, and change this little bit right here. What happens if I don't change this? What happens if I left this as to do's? You would have to do's tier to do's database. Exactly. Yes. I would be interacting with my to do's database. This would not be a big issue at this point, but once we have users and profiles and all of that kind of stuff, where we have shared um, kind of, we have shared schemas between different applications, like we will have a uh, collection of users, we'll have a connection of a collection of profiles, we'll have all of these things that will exist in these applications um that will be similar from application to application and that's going to cause some big issues 
So we've got to make sure that we're changing out our connection here to movies. Uh, Julian, yes. Uh, I forgot. So if you don't set the the name, the database, it just puts it in like a unnamed database in your MongoDB. So if you don't have this, it's going to put it in some like kind of generic, like um, kind of bucket and everything will kind of share from that bucket. Uh, not what you want to be doing. This would be very similar to just leaving this like to do's on all of your projects. Now everything is using that kind of shared like general bucket that exists. And if if like somebody for like forgot that they didn't name it and they're like way down the road, I mean, it's going to be messy, but is there a way to like kind of like fix it? Um, Realistically, I probably wouldn't invest a lot of time fixing something like that in these projects. Um, a lot of the data that we're going to be using here is very like, we don't really care about it. We're just making some stuff so that we have some example data, um, in a like larger production application, yeah. you probably wouldn't forget something like that, hopefully. Um, <laughs> but, um, if you needed that data for some reason, um, you would be able to kind of move that over. It would take some work and some time investment, but like, if that data is important to you, then yeah, sure. You could totally do something like that. Your question. Cool. All right. So um, next thing that we're going to need, uh, we need to make use of the variable that we've created in this file, this database underscore URL. So we're going to need another package to be able to do that. So we're going to do npmi.env. And then back over in our server.js file, we're going to add in this import. If I can, there we go. We're going to add in this import right here. Import dot env slash config dot js. Um, I forgot to mention this, but make sure whenever you're doing npmi dot env, you are actually spelling out the word dot. All right, uh, Mike, yes. This is just a paper cut, but I noticed as I was typing .env slash config.js, my autocomplete for Visual Studio code mm -hmm. included the .js at the end of my config, and it mm -hmm. usually doesn't do that. I think maybe we've touched on this before, but like, is there a reason it did it there, and is there... Anything you can do to ensure that it always does that or doesn't, or why does that, why does it only work sometimes? So it only works sometimes because of a, later on, whenever we are in React, you will be able to exclude the path that we have here. And that is how a lot of libraries will function within uh, within like a lot of JavaScript libraries will function. Express and Node by itself do not function this way. So you have to go in and kind of add them yourself. Um, the reason why we get it here is because we actually like we're in .env slash and then we can see the files that are inside of this package. We have config.js, we have lib, we have package.json and we can select config.js here. Um, if I have if i start doing something with like routes here for example you'll see that we get this kind of this unfortunate little thing that's happening where we just get index here we don't get index.js that is just a quirk of how this works unfortunately um uh, and it's uh, very annoying and i wish it could be fixed easily but <laughs> cuz okay. i feel you <laughs> All right, thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> On behalf of Microsoft, I apologize. <laughs> All right, so um, let's go ahead. We are going to configure Mongoose in a uh, new database module. Again, we've done this before. We've talked about this file, and we've talked about how it's never going to change from project to project. 
So what I'm going to do in here is actually set this up just like we've done it before. Make dir config, touch a config slash database.js file. And now I'm not even going to use what is here in the lecture. Uh, I don't care about this. Um, I'm just going to use a previous project. That is what this previous work is here for, is so that you can just steal from it as you're going and building out this stuff. Whenever I've the whenever I've said like, hey, this is something that will never change, and this is just kind of like boilerplate stuff that exists, this is not stuff that you should be writing out every time. Like, just to be entirely honest with you. Um this is stuff that you will carry from project to project, and we don't really need to think about what is in here um, and definitely not focus on what is in here. Um, we are going to be using the same exact nine lines of code for all of the projects in the next two units. This will not change. There is no reason to go and like memorize what each one of these things are doing. This is not like a big... We don't need to make a big deal about all of this stuff. It's something cool to explore on your own. Um, whenever you feel comfortable with the rest of the stuff that we're doing, that is much more important, like writing controller functions, being able to build routes, that kind of stuff. Those are the things you should be focused on writing. If you're going to write something, write that, not this. All right, so... I said, if you're going to be writing something, you should absolutely be writing those other files. Um, just to clarify, this type of stuff, though, don't waste your time writing this stuff out. Steal it from a previous project. All right. So now back in our server.js, I need to use this file that we've already uh, stubbed up over here, that we've already constructed. I'm going to bring this in. We're going to say connect to MongoDB database. And here we're going to import our config, config slash database.js. All right. Let's make sure that all of this config stuff that we've done so far works. We've done quite a bit here, actually. We've added a couple of new packages. We've added this .env file. We've used our uh, .env file to be able to connect to our uh, MongoDB database. We've imported a few things into our server.js. Let's make sure this all works now. We're going to run nodemon. And hopefully you don't have anything else running. If you do, though, you can always run kill all node. But um, I am good here. I don't have anything running um, on port 3000. So what I'm going to do is swing over to localhost 3000. And I should be good at this point. I should not be crashing or anything like that. I should be connected to the uh, MongoDB database that we've got, I should be able to load our localhost 3000 page with no issues. Does anyone have issues that we can debug at this point? Cool. Does anyone have any questions about anything that we've done here? Also, before we move on, again, this is kind of just a rep of what you all have done a couple of times at this point, but um, I like going through this just so we can see like, hey, I want to start up a new project. How would that be? And this is something you'll uh, actually do again as part of your lab. All right. So. Um, again, we've kind of talked about these review questions before, and since we don't have a ton of questions about this stuff, I'm just going to skip over them. Uh, we'll get into more in the weed stuff later where I might ask you some questions. We'll see. All right. So next, now that I have a database that I'm connected to, I'm going to start 
in this application by building my model. This is typically the action that you'll want to take. You're going to want to create a model and then start creating data that conforms to that uh, schema that you've defined in your model file. That will typically be how you begin. It makes sense to not necessarily read before you're creating, right? And that is exactly what we're doing here. We're going to create first, read the data that we've created second. Can you start an application by building out read functionality first? Yes, you can. Totally possible. But in our case, if there's not data to read, if we don't have anything to read from, then it doesn't really make a ton of sense to read from nothing. So we're going to start in here. We are going to make a new directory called models. And then we're going to add in our movie model file. Remember in here, this is kind of the foundation of all of our future work that we are doing. By having a movie model, it means that we are going to have a movies view directory. We're going to have a movies router. And we're going to have a movies controller that we will eventually create up here. We're going to have all of these different pieces get constructed because we have this movie model. And just as a note, we have named this singularly because there is only a single model that will be exported from this movie model file. Whereas typically with our routes, we will have multiple routes being exported from a router. We will have multiple controller functions be exported from a controller. But we only have one model being exported from our movie model. Uh, Melvin. Just a quick question. We've only worked with one model so far. Are we going to be working with multiple models going forward? Yes. So as part of this application that we work with. So uh, what we will have here uh, today is a, mo a movie data entity. Um, and then eventually what we will move into will be into a comments data entity that will be what is called embedded into this movie um, and into a movie. And then what we'll be doing is uh, building out performers. And those performers will have uh, their own model that will exist on its own. They'll have its the, the that data entity will have its own model that will exist elsewhere. Whenever we have an embedded entity, as you're going to see next week, uh, that is going to live within actually this movie model file that we create. So we'll see how that goes whenever we get there. But um, let me see real quick if I can actually. I think I have this. Pretty sure I have an ERD for this. Let's check it out. If I do. Uh, yep, right here. So this is kind of uh, the ERD that we're going to be looking at as we build out this application. What we're working on today is this movie that's over here on the left. And then we're going to embed, uh, I said comments earlier, this is actually reviews. We're going to embed reviews into our movie. And then we're going to have performers that are actually going to be referenced. Performers will have its own model file. And again, we'll kind of talk about how that functions whenever we get there. Our reviews though, are going to be, because they are embedded inside of movies, they're still going to be part of this movie model file that we're building here. So that's kind of a preview of where we're going with this and uh, that'll all happen next week. But today we're just focusing on this movie part of this. An ERD like this is actually kind of what you will uh, be building out again as part of your project uh, planning requirements. So your project planning requirements will essentially be an ERD like this, uh, which we'll see more next week. 
uh, wireframes, which we'll see a little bit of today, and user stories, which again, we've kind of already talked about and we'll see throughout the day here as well. And those three things will basically make up the entirety of your planning requirements for this project. So um, let's go ahead. Let's build out our movie model. First thing we're going to need to do is import Mongoose. So we're going to import Mongoose from Mongoose. Uh, and then I'm going to make that optional shortcut to schema. This will actually be a little bit more important as we move through this today. Um, you'll kind of see why that is as we work with this. But we're actually going to be use, making use of this shortcut a little bit more than we did with our to-dos. With to-dos, this really did make a ton of sense because I think we used this word in entirety of once. So we kind of had a little bit of duplication there. But you'll see how this actually benefits us uh, later today with this. All right, so what we're going to do now is build out our schema for this. We're going to have a movie schema. And this will be a new instance of the schema class. And we're going to pass into it this schema definition, which is just this object. And remember, for this, we can lean upon the user story that we've already constructed. The movie title, release year, MPA rating, and whether the movie is currently showing. Actually missing something from this user story, which is going to be the cast. We'll talk about that too. So here we'll have a title, which is a string. We'll have a release year, which to simplify things here will be a number. In a larger application, I might use a date in this place instead. Um, for this, though, uh, this will work fine for our cases while we're learning this stuff. Because dates are, as I've alluded to before, a huge pain. Uh, we'll have an MPA rating, which will be a string. We'll have cast members. And here's our first kind of complex data type that we've put into a uh, schema before uh, or until now. So this will be the first one that we've done. And it's going to be an array of strings. What we're going to get out of this will be a set of cast members that are all going to be strings. They'll all be stored inside of this array. And finally, we have now showing, which is a Boolean. And this will be our schema. Uh, Callum, question. Um, for the, uh, the cast array of strings, like each cast member is also going to be a document, right? Um, are the strings in our array of strings their names, their object IDs? Is it a string version of the entire document? That is a wonderful question. So we're actually going to have two phases here. The first iteration of this application that we are going to build is going to be just, uh, frankly, kind of bad. Um, we are going to ask our user to put in the cast members as kind of like comma separated values into an input. That is it. That is going to be our first iteration that we have of this. And that this is going to be kind of a demonstration of why referencing whenever we get to that point is so beneficial to us and why it's good. Uh, it's good for us as people who have to build this application and it's good for our users that have to interact with this application. Uh, so that's going to be our first iteration for this. And it's literally just going to be like, hey, user, go type some things into an input box. And that's going to be our cast members. Um, so we'll kind of see that as we build this out. But that's going to be our first iteration of this. We'll come back and then we'll do a second iteration 
on this where we will refactor this and make it much better. That's when we'll use referencing, uh, and this will be what will actually be an array of object IDs. That is what we will ultimately put in this position. Great question. All right, so uh, for now, though, we have our kind of uh, hacky solution that we are going to uh, come up with here, which is just going to have our cast members as an array of strings. All right, we've already talked about all of these different built-in properties. Again, a lot of this is just review that we've got here. We're making use of more stuff in this application, though. So, for example, we have the title as a string. We have the release here as a number. We have now showing as a Boolean. And we have our cast members as an array of strings. Now, later on, whenever we embed our reviews inside of this, inside of a movie, note here a data type that is missing. What do we not have that we really commonly would probably want to have stored in a database? What an data ID. type is missing? Not an ID. I've got my ob object ID down here. An object? An object. Exactly. I have no way in Mongoose of building objects just as a data type. That is the problem that embedding will solve for us and also referencing. That is what is going to allow us to put things like arrays of objects into these different positions instead. That's why we will eventually need to evolve to be able to use something like that. For now, though, our most complex data type that we're going to be dealing with here is this array. That is the most kind of complex data structure that we can have, is an array. And we'll eventually be turning this into an array of objects. But for now, this will just be an array of strings that we've got here. Now, we do have one thing that we can add into this that's going to be new. We're actually going to keep track of a, a new thing as part of this. We haven't done this before, but we're going to keep track of when things were created and when they were last updated. And to do that, we actually don't add in another field here. I don't add another property into this object. But instead, I'm going to add this new thing that we haven't seen before, this options object. Now, I know that this is kind of weird, but remember that here, this new schema that we're creating, this is just something, this is a class constructor that we are using here. So we're passing in our first argument into that class constructor, and then a second argument into that class constructor, as this is essentially the same as passing two things into a function. I'm passing this first object, and then I have a second object. And like I said, this is really, really similar to just passing two separate things into this, uh, into like a function. Our class constructors behave the exact same way. I can pass two things into this. We saw this whenever we built um, our, like our different vehicles in the last unit. I could pass in all kinds of information about those vehicles. I could pass in if they were um, what their, I think the VIN was. I could pass in like the make and the model, and I could pass in all of these different things because the class was set up to accept all those different things. This schema class is also set up in the same way where I can pass into this multiple objects. So as part of this second object, what I'm going to add in is timestamps, not time series, timestamps, true. That's all I need here. 
what this option here will do is add in the created at and updated at properties on this document. So every single movie that I create will have some documented uh, attributes with it of when it was created and when it was last updated. Mongoose will handle all of the creation, the maintenance of those things all on its own. And we don't have to worry about any of it. And we get all of this data for free. And you'll see this as we work with this data, that this will be a pretty big benefit to us as we kind of work with this information. We aren't going to necessarily use that for this application at all, but that information is there. And it's pretty handy data to have at hand if we ever needed it for some reason. And again, this is all of the work that we have to do. We don't have to do anything in our controller functions to make this work. We don't have to do anything in Mongoose to make this work. All we do is put this in this options object, timestamps true. Now I'm tracking when things were created and when they were updated. Uh, Melvin, question. Where does that uh data and or where does the timestamp information get shown so that will be part of this document so just like every single movie that we create will have a title it'll have a release year it'll have an mpa rating it'll also have what it was created at and when it was updated at that data will live right alongside the rest of these things that we've added in here to this uh schema good question uh nick do we do we separate this out because it's not necessarily information that we would want to share um every time so that we can just uh, like when, when we want to show a new movie we, we're showing the, the information we want to show to the user but we still have this accessible if we want to use it later on so the reason that this is separated out is because this is part of that second options object that we can add in here so we could see in here if i I have a few other options that I have like time series. Um, I have this like two JSON, two object. I have all these different things that can exist in here. I'm simply making use of one of the options that we have. Um, so this is something that is instead of customizing something like we're doing up here, this is something that is simply built into Mongoose that Mongoose knows about inherently. Um, it's not necessarily because, you know, this data might be used or it might not. It is simply because this is something that Mongoose itself is set up to understand and know that, oh, cool, you want timestamps. I will add that to all these documents now. That's that's what that's doing for us. So th so those are that that's information that's only accessible in the options object. So, or, yes, yeah, yeah. So if we want to opt into these types of things, we can add in the option here to set this to true. And now we've opted into this functionality that Mongoose exposes to us. Okay. Thank you. Of course. Great question. Um, this is something that realistically you'll probably add to basically everything that you build um, because there's really no reason not to. This data can be handy. You'll see how this is, um, especially whenever we get into reviews, having access to time data like this is when this comment was added or this is when this review was made is pretty handy. Um, we won't necessarily use it for interacting with a movie, but like I said, this data is here. We might as well just grab onto it and use it and we don't have to maintain any of it ourselves. So, uh, Daniel. Uh, just want to confirm. So if you, for our custom data, it has to be in a separate object from the mongoose. Correct, yes. So that's what this first object is, is like, hey, let's set up our actual schema definition that we like, let's do all of the custom things on this. Whereas this options object is stuff that Mongoose just exposes that we can opt into if we want to. Okay. So our schema has two objects, our custom data, and then anything else that Mongoose makes available to us in an optional second object. Yes. Yep. Now, just to, to clarify a little bit, whenever we create 
one of these documents, whenever we create a movie document, all of these things will appear on the same document inside of the same object, inside of the same document for this movie that we are creating. So whenever we actually have documents that exist in the database, all of this will be bundled together as one. But whenever we're defining how all of this stuff looks, that is that's where we separate this out. And we'll see examples of this as we actually create data. So we'll point it out then too. All right. Um, let's go ahead. Let's compile this into a model. So const movie equals mongoose dot model movie. That is the name of this model that we are creating. Again, we haven't really had a need for this quite yet, uh, but we will as we work in this application. And the thing that we want to compile into our movie model is the movie schema. So again, the name that is here will match the name that we've got here. And there's no reason to really ever alter these to be different from one another. And then we build this movie model using that movie schema. And then finally, our last step, let's export. Hello. Export the movie model. All right, any lingering questions about what we have done here? Uh, yes, Julie. So the on line 15 where you have cons movie, that movie name is always going to be the name of your JS file in the models folder, right? Yes, that is correct. So this here, um, this here and your actual file name should all generally match. Um, there's no reason to really diverge from that. Um, same thing with your actual like schema name. We have a movie schema here. Um, all, all of these things are going to have some overlap. We're just going to basically be changing this word and boom, you have a model. Cool. Any other questions? Very good. We are going to take a break here. I'll give you all 11, 11 minutes, uh, and then we'll come back and we'll talk about partial templates and how we are going to construct partials and why they're super awesome and fun. Have a good break. Uh, Daniel, you have a question? Hey, yeah, no, I think we've talked about this, um, but I just... It's not clear in my brain. Yeah, yeah. The movie model is that is that essentially a class, and we build yes. a model. The schema is a class constructor. Yes. So whenever we have this movie dot model here, this will kind of turn into this movie class that we've got here. Um, that is going to be what was constructed by this actual movie model or this uh, this mongoose model uh, that we've got here. So whenever we pass all of this in, this is very technically a class that we will get out of this. Um, that Does that practically matter as we use it? No, not really, but that is what this is. Okay. Cool. Good question. Well, thank you. Of course.
Hey, Joe, are you available to help me um, get caught up with the lecture since I missed the first hour? Just to make sure my file is set up correct. Anybody available? Hello, Kelsey. Yes, I'm pushing right Hello. now. You should be able to just pull this down and be caught up to where we are. Okay, so just following the steps like the get remote remove origin thing. Yeah. I just want to make sure I'm doing that correctly. Okay, yep, cool. yep, yep. Um, so let me push this up real quick. What you should be able to do is cool. What you should be able to do um, is go through the setup steps for this. Yeah, I'm looking at it right now. And um, so I'm on step two and I just, I did the get remote remove origin and it still says get okay. like main in parentheses for the next line. I wanted to make sure. Totally cool. Okay. Yep. Okay, cool. And then do the upstream part. Yep. And then, and then copy everything. this, run that. Yeah. And that'll be good. Uh, after you do that, there's two more things you'll need to do. Um, okay. Actually, no, if you do this, you should be, there's only one more thing you'll need to do. Um, the... Um... Ba, 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 ba. Um, you should be able to go in and uh, add in your .env file here, um, and then oh, that okay. is right. um, the last thing that you should need to do. You can get okay. this just by copying from an old project that you've got. Right, yeah, yeah, I have it um, saved in a Google Notes or whatever thing. So I, I love it. Use. Fantastic. Yeah. That's the best. And I just need a uh, database URL before the link because. That's, yep, and then exactly. Okay. And um, I can just create that file, like just hit new file, env, env. Yep. 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 Totally. Okay, cool. Um, Perfect. Make sure it's at the same level as your server.js here, though. Um, yeah. The root folder. Yep. Exactly. Yep. I got um, it. And make right. sure that you swap out slash whatever for movie, slash movies. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, and then you should be good. Also, I think I, this should be the only part of any lectures for this mountain trip that I actually missed because I think we are just going to actually leave after class is over. Oh, okay. Deal with cool. A little bit of night driving because um, I don't think Megan, my cousin realized that I get an absence uh, for 15 minutes or more. So that first hour of this lecture should be the only thing I missed while I'm up here. Okay, perfect. That's great. Yeah. Good deal. Awesome. How was everybody's morning? Anybody? So good. Yeah. <laughs> We're having a good time. It's basically every you haven't missed anything realistically. Um, everything oh, okay. that we've covered so far has been a review. Um, the okay, only cool. real new thing that we have in here um, is that we have this like cast array. So okay. this will be like this. Um, this will be like the most wild thing that we've seen so far is in a model. Um, okay, cool. We're going to have kind of two iterations of this uh, of this schema. The first one so is going to have go back through it again. Yeah, yeah. So we'll have okay, this cool. um we'll have this cast array that we have here. Um mm -hmm. and our first iteration of this will be an array of strings. And we're going to have the user do some kind of jank stuff to be able to um put in a a set of comma separated values essentially into an input box. Um and okay. then uh eventually we'll iterate on this and we'll actually reference some uh performers that exist okay cool why does joe look like he's in a willy wonka tunnel joe that's too much color i don't <laughs> what is happening <laughs> <laughs> the blue is particularly like it does something Incredible. with the sharpness of your face which is not what you want <laughs> yeah, it's like overexposed uh-huh <laughs> Also, I have my headphone, like all my audio and everything going through my headphones now because I don't want to bug everybody with all of the stuff that's going on, like in the main area of the house. It's very weird. It's echoey in here. <laughs> Is there an underscore between database and URL before the link? Can I just see the where? Uh, yes. Where oh, it's database an underscore sign. URL equals. Cool. Not password. Anymore. Yeah, like I, uh, my bulletin board behind me. It's beautiful. Thank Wonderful. you. I like that there's now memes on it. I'm going to keep adding to it. <laughs> it's going to be all, all my, my collection of, of things. It's beautiful.
I had a question. Um, last night yeah. I was trying to open up my port uh, thing or whatever to like see what was going on and whatnot for my lab. And it was like really slow to load. And I was like, why is it not, what's happening? I don't know like what could cause that. And also my internet was being weird. So I was like, I can't even ask. <laughs> <laughs> You're trying um, to open up your what? The and port it 3000, weird? like the, it like. Oh, like just at... starting up the app was slow? Yeah, it wouldn't load the in my browser very well. It was it took like five minutes. It was really weird. Wow, that's super weird. But like all of all like if I tried to open Pinterest or like my Gmail, all of those things loaded totally fine. But then weird. that just wouldn't I don't know what was going on. Um probably loaded, what I do in that situation though. is yeah, like what I do in that situation is like you were your app may be like needing more RAM than you're able to provide, which it realistically doesn't need a ton, but um, you might've been maxed out. And I don't know. I mean, that might've been so. the cause of I it. I have yeah. about this one here. What do I have? Um, RAM is your memory, right? Yeah. Yeah, I have a 16 awesome. gigabyte. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so you should be good then. Yeah, um, I bought this yeah, to run know. Illustrator and After Effects at the same time. Yeah. It should be able to handle that. <laughs> it should, yes. <laughs> yeah. um, After Effects likes to try to blow up people's computers, so yep, <laughs> if it can handle that. I think it should be able to handle uh, a couple yes. of coding things. Um, yeah, that's weird. I maybe a restart, I possibly, but yeah, I turned my computer off last night and turned it back on, so that it was yeah, cool. I don't know what was going on. <laughs> yeah, that's fun. <laughs> All righty. Uh, so, um, let's go ahead and we're going to talk about a new and wonderful, awesome thing called partials. Um, currently, whenever we want to write a new uh, kind of EJS file. We have to come in, we set up our HTML boilerplate, and we come in here and we add all the things that we want to add, and we change out our title and blah, 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 blah. We do all this stuff. But it would sure be nice if, like, I just was using the same HTML head that I've set up once over and over and over as I build out my different views. And that is the problem that templates will solve for us. or not templates, but partials, partial templates. So uh, all of our partials are going to be stored in their own little directory. And it's going to live inside of the views directory. And it's going to be called partials. So we're going to make a new directory in here called partials that's in the views directory. So there's our new directory in here that we've had. And in this, I'm going to touch a few files, an HTML head, a nav, and a footer. So. We have these three files. And their names are pretty self-explanatory, but what we're going to have in here is a header with our HTML head. This will essentially be this part of this document that we've got here. We are also going to have a nav which is also a little bit self-explanatory. This is going to behold a nav bar. And we're also going to have a footer. And the benefit of doing all of this is so that we kind of have these little modules that we can pull in to whatever template or whatever view that we are creating whenever we want. And we'll have kind of this shared place where all of our, for example, nav items are going to live. They'll all live in this nav.ejs. So what this is going to do is prevent us 
from having to rewrite the same nav bar over and over and over and over and over as we build this application. And we'll simply say, hey, our nav bar is over there. Let's go use that. And that is the benefit of having partials. And then as this app evolves and as we add things into this application, whenever we want to change the nav bar, we only have to do it in one single location. And the changes that we make in that one location are going to be reflected across every single view that we write. Partials are really, really cool and they are super handy. So let's talk about our HTML head. So something that is going to be a little weird about this file is that in here, what we're going to do is open the head tag, but we're actually not going to close it. We'll kind of get into the why of this here in a little bit, but there is a reason behind this. There's a reason that we are opening this head tag and we are not closing it in the same HTML head tag or HTML head.ejs file. And remember that everything that we put in here is going to be shared between all of our different uh, views that we create. So one of the items that we're going to make use of in here is this main.css. In this main.css, these rules that we have in here are going to apply to every single page that we write. Anything that we put in this main.css is going to be used across our entire website. Because we're going to be using this HTML head.ejs partial on every single view on our site. This offers us a lot of really good benefits. Again, first being that everything is going to be consistent across our entire site. On every single page, we're going to have a gray background color by default. Our main tag or our main tag that we have in any file in here is going to be turned into a flex box. The flex direction of that's going to be centered or column. It's going to align all of its items to the center. So we have a few other rules that we'll talk about in here whenever we actually get to them. There's a lot of stuff for our nav bar and we'll kind of discover those as we write out our nav. Uh, but a lot of this is just going to be kind of some base rules that we apply across this entire site. You will see that we are using grid in here for some of this. So just a good little um, thing to point out. We'll talk about this a little bit more whenever we get to um, actually writing some of these elements. Um, but for now, most of what we're concerned about here is going to be the top part of this. And really more this part of this right now. And we'll come back and talk about what's happening in the rest of the CSS in a little bit. Uh, Melvin, question. You might be getting into this in a bit, but what is telling uh, main.css to apply to every page in our app? So we'll get to that. Okay. <laughs> I figured that was the case, but... <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good thought, though. Okay, cool. So what we're going to do to make use of this, we're going to build a CSS link. And of course, as we've talked about before, everything in this public directory is going to have a route. Right now, all we have in here are style sheets. So 
everything here is going to live on slash style sheets. Because again, whenever our app starts up, a route will be created for slash for, for the style sheets directory and the files inside of it, including main.css. So style sheets slash main.css. That's going to be this file right here that we've already kind of talked about. We're going to use another thing in here too called font awesome. I'll kind of talk about this whenever we get more into our nav bar. Oh, hello. Not what I wanted. For now, I'm just going to copy this over though into our application. With that done and out of the way, I'm then going to add in, or I'm going to change my title that's up here. Order of these things doesn't really matter a ton because they are not referencing one another. Uh, I am going to butts around with this order just a little bit so that we're aligned with what is in the lecture. And here, instead of document, I'm going to do some EJS for the title. Note that because we're going to be using this across all of our different pages that we write, this means that we are going to need to pass a title in the controller function to every single view that we write. We need title data. And we'll see this play out as we move through this as well. All right. So this is our HTML head done. Let's talk about the nav next. And in the nav, this partial is actually going to close our head tag. So let me do some HTML boilerplate again, just so I have all of this written. So we have HTML head where we open our head tag, but we don't close it until nav.ejs. Something to note, again, we'll talk about why this is in a little bit. We're also going to open the body tag in nav.ejs, but not close it. And then right after we open that body tag, we're going to add in a nav. All right, next, inside of our nav, we're going to add in this I thing. This is an I element. Uh, this is what uh, Font Awesome, which we'll talk about momentarily, will be using to actually display its kind of like icon thing. That is how um, uh, that is how Font Awesome is going to uh, represent its different icons. Essentially, here what we're going to have and what we can see in this wireframe is a little icon that will exist in the upper left hand corner. That's what Font Awesome is going to get us. And it does this by using class names. So we're going to have I class equals, and then we'll have FAS, FA dash film, and then FA dash 2X. And at this point, you're probably like, what in the world would we just do? What is all of this junk? Where did this come from? Why are we doing this? So what this is getting us is this icon that we've got up here in the top left of this page. But why is it getting us that? Well, let's swing over to Font Awesome and take a look at it. So Font Awesome lives at fontawesome.com. And Font Awesome serves up icons. They are an icon library. 
They have all kinds of different free and paid icons. Um, there are around 2,000 free icons that we can get through them. And they look like this. These are awesome to be able to use on your own websites as you're building stuff out, especially in Unit 2 when things can get a little bit text-looking. <laughs> we don't have lots of images going on here. So this is a good way to kind of break up some of that uh, more text-heavy elements that we are working with here. Um, so that is kind of why we're introducing it uh, here. So um, the do, 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 do. what we are using here, this script, this is a shared script that we all have. This is actually tied to an old version, version five. So if you're using this same script, make sure that you're looking at version five because that is what this kit is tied to. This is not tied to version six. This is an older version of Font Awesome. If you want to sign up for Font Awesome and use version six, that is going to be free. And they uh, and you can use these kind of newer icons that they have available in here. But if you use this script that we've got right here, this points to the old version. So you have to use the old uh, kind of version of their icons here. Just as a note, highly recommend just signing up and getting your own kit so that you are able to use that newer version, though. Uh, the, you can use those free icons. Uh, Andrew, question. Yeah, so what file type are those icons are they coming in as images and it's like inserting the images for you okay yeah cool. yeah yeah so those are they're coming in actually as svgs scalable vector graphics um those are a, something that we'll talk about um as we kind of move through the course um but these are basically they will display as images to your user as you're uh implementing them So, like I said, we need to be using version five or version five that we've got up here. And I can search through these and I can find all of let's look for a movie. And here we've got film. And here we can see the exact code that we need to use to implement this icon. So that is exactly what we have done here. We are basically taking this documentation, just like we've looked at documentation before and, mim and mimicked that. Uh, we are assigning this a class of FAS and FA-Film. We also have some a modifier here, this FA-2X, that essentially is just making this appear a little bit larger. So it'll fill up our nav bar. Um, they have all kinds of um, bah, 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 all kinds of documentation in here on how this works. Again, if you're using this kit, you want to make sure you're on version five of their docs. But they describe all of the bah, 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 bah. they describe all of the kind of icons that you uh, have access to, how to use them. Um, and kind of what you're going to want to do to be able to uh, make use of all of this stuff. Um, let me see. This is not what I want, actually. Let's go to web. There we go. Uh, so here, style, size, icons. What we're doing is this FA2X, which is making this. This is the one, two, three, four, one, two, three. That makes it this size right here. All right. So um, this is kind of just a quick little view into how this is working. Again, you don't have to explore this at all. This is just a fun little thing that we can touch on very briefly here. And, uh, you know, you can feel free to poke around inside of this and uh, use icons on your own projects, on your labs, all of that kind of stuff. 
Um, again, if you're using this kit, just make sure you're using version five of everything. Make sure you're view viewing the docs for version five. Make sure that you are uh, using the icons for version five as well. Or you can just get your own kit and you can use the newest version, which has more icons in it anyway. All right, so this is the foundation of our nav. Let's talk about the rest of what's going to happen here. What we're going to do is add in an anchor tag. And for this, where we want to go is our new um, our new page. We want the user to be able to add in a uh, new movie. So just a spoiler, that's going to live on slash movie slash new, but we can reference the chart if we wanted to, to get that same thing out of this. Again, our resource is now movies. And just like whenever we wanted to view a form to add a new to-do, we're going to implement this functionality where we are going to view a form to add a new movie. So we'll eventually be making a get request on slash movie slash new, where we will return a view with a form in it to add a new movie. That is what we're linking to right now. Just going to build a new page here. So bright. Let's keep that chart up. We're going to need it throughout the day anyway. All right. So our link here is going to go to slash movies slash new. I want to preemptively split this across lines. So that's our link. And then we're going to have a class in here as well. Our class is going to be dependent upon where we are at. So this is actually going to be kind of interesting. Remember how we're passing a title here. We have to pass a title here already. All of our pages are going to need to have a title passed to them because we have the title here being displayed dependent upon that data. So what we can do is actually now make decisions based off of the title that is in here. So here we could say, is the title add movie? If the title is add movie. then what I want to print here will be the string active. Otherwise, I'm going to print nothing. Now, let's talk about why we've kind of chosen this pattern. So again here, what we're setting at the end of the day is a class name. That is the thing that is happening here. We are setting a class name either to active or to nothing. Let's talk about why, though. And the answer here lies in our CSS. What we're going to do is actually change the name of these or change the, how our uh, links look up in the uh, up in the nav bar dependent upon if we are on the active page or not. If we are not on the page, or if, if the link is for a different page than the one that we are on, it is going to be this color here, this kind of grayish color. If we are currently on the page, if we are on the active page that matches the link, we are going to change the color of that to white because it will have the active class. So, for example here, 
Whenever we're on the ad performer page, this link, this ad performer link up top will be white. If we're on the ad movie page, then the ad movie link up top is going to be white. If we're on the all movies page, then the link here will be white, whereas the other ones will retain their color. So whenever we're on the active page, whenever we are on the ad performer, ad movie, or all movies page, that corresponding link in our nav bar will turn white. It'll be a really good indication that we are already on that page that uh, we are looking at up top. So again, this is just a really... Um, this is a kind of uh, way that we can go about that because we're already passing the title data to this page. Um, I do need to close out my EJS here. To make this work. So again, if the title of the page that we are on is add movie, then we will have the class be active. Otherwise, there will be no class name at all for this. So that here is kind of step one of this work. Let's throw our actual link text in here, add movie. And this is the foundation of our nav bar. Uh, Steven, question. Yeah, why is it that the closing head tag isn't in the header and the closing body tag isn't in the nav instead of the footer? We'll get there. Okay. You'll see. I promise. <laughs> okay, cool. Uh Nick, yes. Um, so when when you're when you're creating your um uh, anchor tag with a class, um you have parentheses um uh, around the we're at the start of the uh, squid and at the very end. And what's in what's in the the notion does not have that. I have oh quotes. I do have quotes here. Yeah, I should have quotes. Um do I need I uh let's let's leave them off actually. Sorry about that. I was just curious which one was right. I, I believe that this is right. I believe Notion is correct. If it's not, we'll swing back and fix it. Okay. Thank you. All right. So um, next thing in here, we're going to swing over to the footer. So now the basis of all of our pages is going to look kind of like this. Where I have... Let's make that a little bit thinner. Let's make this a little bit thinner. Okay, cool. And then here is where I'm going to close a body tag and where I'm going to close also my HTML. So as we are composing our different views, this will basically be our starting point. We'll have all of this HTML already kind of pre-written for us. And we'll be able to add on layers on top of this. Let's actually see this in action. We are going to make use of all of these different things in an updated index.ejs file. I'm going to close all of this other stuff that we're working with currently. And let's make use of all of this work. Um, I don't know why that is double quotes and everything else single. Cool. So in here, what you're going to see is a new type of EJS tag. We are going to call this, I, I believe Ben has already referred to this as the squid flipping you off. 
It's not a squid with ink. It's just the squid with this single dash. What this will do is print raw HTML to our page. That is what we want to do in this case. Whenever we do a squid with ink, what it is actually doing is making sure that we aren't actually writing this content as HTML. We will not be able to do things like write HTML with a squid with ink. Would not work. This would just print as text, not an actual div element that gets put onto the page. This would look like a div as it is written exactly right here. It will not create a new div element on our page. But if I switch this to be a squid flipping you off, this will create a div on our page. This will create a div element. It will not create text like this. This will create actual elements in our HTML. Which is what we want to do whenever we use these partials. We want to create HTML elements. So what are the rules for whenever we want to use the squid flipping you off or whenever we want to print HTML to the page versus whenever we want to print actual text to the page? And the rule there is, is if there is anything that is user generated, you want to make sure that you're using your squid with ink. If your user is typing some data into a form, Whenever you print out that data, you want to make sure that it is always a squid with ink, not the squid that's flipping you off. Whenever you're doing the squid with ink, what it's going to do is make sure that you're not creating new HTML elements on your page. So we do the squid flipping you off whenever we control the content that is going to be displayed here. And that is exactly the condition that we have here. We have built this HTML head. We've built this nav. We've built this footer. We control all of the content here. Therefore, we can use the squid flipping you off without being scared that our users tried to do something bad on our site, like try to add in a script tag or something like that. So to actually go in and add this and to reference this, one of these partials that we've already created, we're going to use the keyword include. Include. And then we just have a a um, string here that will point to our partials. So we're in index.ejs and we want to go into the partials directory. So this will be dot slash partials slash HTML dash head. Note that you do not get autocomplete here. This is something you'll probably copy and paste onto your different pages as you're working with it once you make sure that you have it working. This is not something you want to be writing over and over. So now we're going to do the same thing with our nav. So let's do our EJS with a da 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 uh, EJS output escaped or squid flipping us off. We're going to include our partials slash nav. And then let me go ahead and include our partial footer. And then we'll test this out. And we'll actually see this in action. Include slash partials footer. Uh, Mike, yes. Would this break if you included the file extension, the .ejs, at the end of those include statements? I It should not break, but you do not need it. 
pretty sure you know about break we can try it yes sorry <laughs> yeah there are there are times where not including it will break things is there so like it seems to me like i'm just going to do that every time that's why i'm asking yeah yeah Watching you rule of thumb yeah yeah rule of thumb is if it is ejs you don't need to include it oh okay i couldn't find that yeah. Also, so that is so like whenever we have uh ba, 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 here, like whenever we're doing whenever we're rendering index, we aren't including EJS here. We're not saying index.ejs, even though we're referencing the index.ejs file. Same rule kind of applies here. I had all right, I had not noticed that trend that EJS was the thing that got left off. I noticed leaving off .js sometimes broke things. Yes, if you leave .js off of things that will break stuff. Okay. For also sure. you you made a typo in your index. I mean that's, you know, how things go, right? On oh, nave. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it. All right. So, I just want to look at what we have here before we do anything else. Let's just load up this index.ejs. Let's open our app, check this out. Let's see what we have so far before I add any more concepts to this. I'm going to do a refresh on localhost 3000. And we have this. Pretty cool. So what we have in here, what was sent to our user was this. This is the composed and rendered HTML that we got out of this. This looks pretty familiar. This is a combination of this file that I have here I'm just going to throw this in here just so we can see it. And then our nav file that we have here. And then our footer file that we have here. And that is exactly what we're seeing whenever we get over to our browser, whenever we render these three things, what is actually appearing in this document is this, the three files that we have included here. All right. I know I still haven't talked about why we're splitting up body, why we're splitting up our head and all of that. But outside of that, do we have any questions about how this is structured so far? Yes, Melvin. It's a question. It might not come up now, but if um, if you did want to include a footer of some sort, I, I just assume it goes above the uh, closing of the body in the HTML tags in the footer dot uh, ejs, right? Exactly. So if we wanted to have a footer here, we would add it to the top of this file footer. This is my footer. And now whenever I swing back over to my browser, do a quick little refresh. This is my footer. You'll need to style this, of course, and make it actually go to the bottom, but uh, that's a thing for another day. <laughs> All right. So let's talk about why we've structured this the way that we have. Why have we split up the opening and closing of our head tag? Why have we split up the opening and closing of our body tag? Well, look at how this gets composed. So here we have, uh, let's say that, let's go do a comment. This is the start of index.ejs. Not what I wanted. This is the start of uh, nav.ejs. Uh, and then we have the start of footer. Dot EJS. And then we have again the start of our HTML head dot EJS.
So what we can do, I'm going to actually, let's really delineate this stuff. Let's make sure that we are able to see the ends as well. So we have the start, we have the end, and we have the start, and we have the end. So now we can kind of see that there we get some space in here in this actual file that we're composing where we can do some custom work. So let's kind of explore this. We'll swing back to the head here in a little bit, but inside of our, between our nav.ejs and our footer.ejs, if I want to write content that will go into the body, I have a place where I can do this between the end of nav.ejs and the start of footer.ejs right here. So for example, I can throw a main tag in here. And inside of this, uh, what are we actually displaying? Uh, the title. I'm going to have an H1 and we're going to display the title. And now, because we've included this between our nav and our footer, whenever this view is rendered to our user, this is going to go right here. Between the end of nav.ejs and the start of footer.ejs. So let's actually see this in action. Let's refresh our page. And we'll see now that this looks like this. We have being sent to us this. And you can see that it's been composed exactly like what we have here. Here's the end of our nav.ejs. And between our the end of our nav.ejs and the start of our footer.ejs, we can write our main tag. And that is what we will show to our user over here. That is why we split up our tags like this. That's why we don't close the body in the nav.ejs. If we closed the body in nav.ejs, now we've written content that is outside of the body of our site. That's not what we want. We want to make sure that we are working in the body so that we have valid HTML. And also so that things work just in general. If you throw things out of the body, things go wonky really, really quickly. So that's why we've got this split. Do we have any questions about this? Cool. All right. So how we have things now, you can see that this is super, super slim down. We had like, we normally to accomplish this, we would need, you know, what? Uh, 44 lines of code. We're accomplishing that same work in nine lines of code. Same exact thing. And we can now come in, we can edit all of this stuff at will. And it will change across our entire site. We get so many wins by using partials. It makes everything so much easier. We will use these the rest of this unit. Any questions about partials at all whatsoever? Uh, Julian, yes. So if you know, like with the nav, if you know on your website that it's going to be consistent, that's why we do this. That's why we separate it. Yes, yes. So up here, we'll kind of get into why our nav is separate from our HTML head and here in a little bit. But this is going to allow us to customize just like we can customize here what goes into our body. Anything that we put here 
will be customized to go into the HTML head because we haven't actually closed the head tag yet between HTML head and nav. So anything that is unique to just this page that we want to put up in the head, like a different style sheet, that is where this will go. And we'll see this play out as we actually work with the next things that we're doing. Cool. So this gives us how we have constructed these partials gives us a ton of flexibility. It gives us the ability to essentially opt into this kind of standardized main.css, right? So all of our page will at least have these rules attached to them. But we're also going to be able to use whenever we create them some different um, some different uh, CSS that is going to be unique to a particular page where I want to have these unique rules. Uh, Musto. Uh, do you mind pushing real quick? Yes, I will push. Uh, we're about to take a break, so I'll push uh, as we go on break. Uh, Callum. Why do you have one main style sheet rather than a style sheet for... H, I guess you wouldn't need HTML head styling, but nav and like, why do you have all of that styled in one place instead of breaking it out? So I'm styling all of this in one place because this is going to be kind of our like base CSS that is shared between all of our different places. And we might as well just throw that all in one file. I could break this out potentially and say like, hey, now I've got like this main CSS and I've got a nav CSS. I could theoretically do that. Um, there's really like this file is not overly large in this case. I'm not concerned about like splitting this up. And really that just makes more work for you in the long run. If you get like too delineated, especially with your CSS. Um, so that's kind of why I've made that choice here. Um, so yeah. Good question. Cool. Any other questions? Fantastic. Um, I'm going to push up my code. I'm going to send you all on. Let's do a 12 minute break. Be back at 10 after. I have a and quick question, will... David. Yes, yes. Quick question. Yes. How good does that uh, breakfast taco look? Oh, that looks incredible. That looks very my good. My wife Except... uh, went out. Oh, yeah. Where, where'd you go? Yeah. Uh, just a little spot here in Georgetown. Ah, those are the best. That's yeah. that's that's what you want. <laughs> it's like <laughs> an actual family that runs uh -huh. it, and there's like mm -hmm. kids in there doing their homework. If you go in in the afternoon, like uh -huh. that's how you know. Yep, yeah, that's it's how like, you know. <laughs> get those little half ounce containers of salsa. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 So good. So good. Uh, good times. All right, I'm going to eat. See y'all. Yeah, do it. Y'all have a good break.
All right, come on back, everybody. Okay. So um we have one less small 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 to change to make here. Uh currently you can see that our title of this application is Express and we're displaying Express here. Ah, that's not what we want really. Uh so this means changing up how our function works for this in our index.js. Just as a note here, recall that this is technically a controller function that would exist. This is not a um, something that we are going to be building an entire file for just to hold uh, like literally three lines of code. Um, so this does exist in your index.js routes. So just as a note on where this is actually located in your code, uh, this is going to be called Mongoose Movies. Fresh, beautiful. We have Mongoose movies up here in our title bar, and we have it on our page. Uh, just while we're talking about this, if I take this away, if I take away our object here, what's going to happen? What is the error that I'm going to get? 404. On the page. page. Module not found. Title is not defined. The reason that we are getting this here, title is not defined, is because we are not passing title data to this page. This is like a, hey, I'm waving my hands, I'm flashing some lights, pay attention right now. If we don't pass a title to the page, this is the error that you're going to get. As you go through and you're doing your flights lab, this is associated with what we're doing here. This is the error that you will probably see. Blank is not defined. If we're not passing a title to our page here, we're going to have an issue. Um, what if I come in and uh, let me, before I add this back in, um, before I add this back in, if in my index.ejs I remove title here and instead put mongoose movies, will I still get title not defined whenever I refresh this page? Yes. I will. Why? Because title is a key uh, or is a property or not quite. Where else am I using title? In the partial. Yeah, exactly right. In my HTML head that I'm loading here on line one, I'm making use of the title. So if I refresh this page and I'm still not passing title to this, even though I don't have title listed anywhere in this view, I'm going to get that same error. Title is not defined. Because I am using it in my HTML head partial. I have this here on line 12. I need to have a title available to me here. I need to pass that data to this page. So if I fix that, title Mongoose Movies, do a refresh, everything's good. I can even add back in my title here. Any questions at all about that? That is a huge error that people will repeatedly run into, especially as they're doing this lab is I don't have title defined and I don't know why I need title and I I why is it asking me for a title? Why does title keep saying undefined? That is why. If we aren't passing this title here, things are going to break. This means that we need to pass title 
anywhere where I'm using this HTML head file partial. And because I'm going to be using this partial through this entire project, I'm going to need to pass a title at every single view that we build. All right, so from here, let's actually create some data. What we're going to do is use the five-step process to implement create functionality. We've been going through this five-step process for a bit now. What we're going to do, we've already kind of conceptualized this route as part of step one, where we are determining the proper route. I've already written this here in my nav. It's going to be on slash movies slash new. So that's done. This is because it isn't an anchor tag. We'll emit a get request. The UI that is going to issue this request is already built. We've done this already in our nav.ejs. I'm going to be able to access this ad movie from any page in this site. What I need to do next is actually build this route on our server. This will be a little bit of work. What's the first thing that I need to do as part of this process? I need to define this route on my server. What do I need? The corresponding um, route file, like your JS, we have an index. We need a file for the, I guess, movies. A perfect place to start. Let's make that file. So I'm going to touch a routes movies.js file. Note how we're pluralizing this. We will have multiple routes leaving this file. Okay, cool. What do I do next? Check the chart. Check the chart. Cool. I've checked the chart already. I know I need to make this route. Slash movie slash new. So now what? Do we... Well, we probably need stuff in our movie JS file. That would make you sense. You need to yeah. import the router. Where? From Express. Do we just take everything from the user's file and put it into the movie's file? Totally. I love that. Let's steal all this. Perfect. I love this starting point. So um, let's go ahead. Let's just stub up this route here real quick. Slash movies slash new. That's what I'm going to need to hit. So therefore... This needs to be what and why. Slash new. Slash new. Why is that? Because the server is going to tell the route to start with slash movies. Mm, that's very true. Have we done that yet? No. We should probably do that. So let's go ahead. I'm going to import this router. Router as movies router from slash routes movies.js. Beautiful. There's my movies router. Now I need to mount it. App.use. What do I need to put here? Slash new. What's my resource? Slash movie. Exactly. Movies. Comma new. Where do I want to point any request on slash movies to? Movies router. Exactly. My movies router. So now every single request that lives in slash movies is going to be forwarded 
to or every request that we make on slash movies is going to be forwarded to our movies router. So every single route, all routes in this file start with localhost 3000 slash movies. Steven, question. Um, the When we did our like dev lab and stuff, the users became like to do's became skills or whatever we used. In yep. this case, we're still keeping users. It still serves a purpose. We could totally get rid of this. We okay. could have altered this here. I was going with the flow of kind of what we said to do. I'm cool with however we want to handle this. All that we need to have at the end of the day is this movie's route. I'm probably going to go ahead and delete this now um, just because it's going to make things a little bit more clear and we'll have fewer files to work with and all that. But I just kind of go into the flow here. That's why we didn't rewrite this, but we totally could have Thank totally you. valid. Yep. Uh, Musto. I'm, I'm not sure if it's just my computer that didn't grab it, but um, did you, were, were you able to push from the last time? Um, I believe I did. Let me go ahead. Let me add commit and push again. Thank you. Okay, I am pushed now. Can you um, also just the server JS file, the changes that you made? Um, mm -hmm. You just I wanted to look at that again. There was totally. The, oh yeah, so you just did that. Okay, and that's all that we changed in that file. Yep, these two lines we added line fifteen and line thirty six. We imported. Oh, the movie. Okay. Yep, we imported the router and then we made use of that router by mounting it down uh, with the rest of our routes. Cool, makes sense. Melvin. Can you just quickly remind me what it means to mount a router? Mounting a router. So we've imported the router here, just like we would import Express, just like we've done here. But just like we're not using Express until we actually make use of this within our file, we need to actually make use of this imported movies router. This is how we do that. So we import the router, and then we actually use the router in the method that we need it to be used in. Um, while we're here, I'm going to go ahead and get rid of all of the stuff around users. Um, there's no need for this, and we can just scrap it. Um, so we might as well do that. One less thing for us to contend with as we work with all of this stuff. Again, if you renamed users to movies, that's totally cool too. If you went down that path, however, we get to the point that we are currently at, 100% valid. Uh, Julian. Uh, so just going on what Melvin was talking about. So when you imp when you import it and then you mount it, is that like plugging in like a drive to your computer? Is the importing part and then like mounting it is when it like shows up on your computer, like. Yeah, that's a great way to think about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. We're like, it exists here, but it doesn't actually, we don't use it anywhere in this file until here. That's a great way to think about it. It's like, hey, that drive exists. We've plugged it in, but we haven't made use of it until we actually mount that. Um, we mount the uh, drive into our file system. Cool. Very good. All righty. Uh, Steven, yes. Sorry, one more question. Um, no, totally cool. I know, so like, I know the notion and then we use get. Um, but if, according to the chart, if we're trying to create a new blog, shouldn't we be using post? Mm, great question. So what what functionality are we trying to implement here? What is, we're working towards this. This is our wireframe that we've constructed here where we are going to display this form to our user um, or something that looks relatively similar to this form to our user. And then the user is going to enter the data into this form and then click this button. So what we're doing here is this two-step process. We have one action where I need to show this page to my user. I need to show the user this form. The user then needs to enter the details here, 
And then using those details that the user has entered, they will click this button. And from there, the movie will actually be created in the database using the information here. So what we're doing is a two-step process. The first step is showing the user this form, which will be a get request on slash movie slash new. The second is when we will actually be creating the information in the database once the user has filled out this form. Cool. Great clarification. Yes, Kelsey. So just so that I make sure that the way that I am understanding that is correct. So because I've, I've been having a hard time trying to figure out like how to read the chart in a way that makes sense to me. Like Velvet mm -hmm. said, like I've been trying to understand it on my terms. Mm -hmm. So I like you're saying we need to show them something and I was the typical controller action. So when that's sort of what you should reference first is that column where it says index or show or create or update. That's sort of what you're doing first. So it's a get request because we're showing something to them first, but it is also creating something. So can you, is that why we're not like using posts because that only creates something and it doesn't show anything. Exactly. But you can yes. make it create something the way that post does in a get request, or is it something else is happening somewhere else is creating it? That's sort of something like else. So whenever we're thinking about these methods that are here, whenever we're using mm -hmm. a get method, this is always going to be something we want to display something to the user. I want to show the user something on their page. Whenever we're thinking about these other ones, post, put in patch, and delete, these are actions that are happening in our database. That is why we are using these specific terms. These terms have meaning around like we are creating resources. We are updating resources. We are deleting resources. That is what these methods over here are describing are those specific things that are happening because we are making a request using one of these methods. So Whatever we would use like a post. making a new user be something like you would use a post for? Like where it you're would, yes. like a full new resource? Okay. So making mm -hmm. like a single item like the way that we're doing this and whatever the get request we're showing them something isn't the same as like making an entire new piece of data that's going to exist in our database. Correct. Yes. Just I, so okay. as, essentially like yes. I need a way for the user to be able to type things into a box. That is That is the goal that we are trying to achieve right now is I want the user to be able to type in things into an input. So to be able to have the user type things into an input, I need to show them something. I need to make sure that they are able to see the form, right? Using one of these get requests, using either this like, hey, let's read all, hey, let's read a specific blog, hey, let's make a, uh, let's return a form to add a new blog, hey, let's return a form to edit a, a new blog. Those are our like four get actions that we are going to have is I want to show you something. It is always going to be that like, let's look at this user. Um, these actions, post, put, patch, and delete, those are for us. Those are things like, okay, cool. The user is submitting data in a form. I want to create a new resource based off of the information that they have submitted in this form. Same thing with put is like, hey, the user has submitted this form. I need to update a resource dependent upon the information that they've put into this form. Same thing with delete. The user wants to delete this thing in the database. All of these actions are for us. Post, put, patch, delete. They're not for the user. So here, what we're trying to do is return that form so that the user can add a movie. This is for our user. Uh, Nick, yes. So so with these, we're not we're, we're not manipulating the database at all. We're, it just looks like to the user that we are. Exactly. So with a get request with any get request, all you will ever be doing is reading from the database at most. Okay, that makes way more sense. Yeah, that makes these a lot other, more sense now. Thank you. Yeah, totally, yeah. These other actions, post, put, and patch, delete, that's when data is being altered in some way in the database. Did that answer your question, Julian? I saw your hand up for a hot second. Yeah, I mean, that cool. what you said makes a lot of sense. So like post, put, patch, and delete is just for the database. Yeah, exactly. Perfect. Cool. 
All right. So uh, back over here. Again, this is where we are trying to go. Show the user this thing. So what we're going to do now. Um, let's go ahead and uh, we have defined the route on our server, I believe. Let's make sure we've done that. Yes, slash new. So I need to change this action, though. And I'm going to make this movies control dot new. All right. I'm going to throw you all into groups real quick. And I'm going to have you do this next part. What I want you to do is literally just stub up a controller function. You're going to need to think about how you're going to do that. And then have this connect to it. And essentially all you'll be doing as part of this check is making sure that we're able to run a sanity check. That you're able to call this movies control dot new uh, function that you will need to write. And again, you'll be doing this as a group. Um, How many do you put, want in a group? Um, I'm going to do, let's say, three to four. Preferably groups of three, so keep it on the low end of that. Ten four. Um, yeah, cool. Uh, I'll give you, we'll do a little bit more than... Um, Five minutes for this, we'll just go until 40 after, so. Whenever we're ready, Joe. Take us away. Rooms are open. Cool. Have fun. Yay. Julian. Oh, Julian's in trouble. Uh, nothing like the walk of shame back to your computer. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Dev Skills Lab look Dev Skill Labs look pretty good so far. Yeah, I'm trying to debug mics right now. I don't know what's going on with this. So weird. Oh, I had a, I had some fun bugs. Um, there was one where because they didn't put they didn't inject the EJS value when they edited, um, and they they didn't put it into a string. Uh, anytime you would go to edit the text. Um, it would just take the first word and then break on a space character and give back mm. just like whatever the first word was as like the thing that you'd edited. That was fun. Oh, you had people actually do the edit. Yeah. Okay. It's fun because you get to just be like, here's some fun debugging on something that doesn't matter at all because you already passed this entire thing. <laughs> it's like not related to how they've done on like the rest of it. I'm missing something really stupid. Yay.
And you don't like my new lights? Can't even see them. Are you doing? You're doing party wizard, but in real life, right? Huh? You're doing party wizard. Party what? Earlier, the lights were like. It party wizard's a thing, right, David? I'm not crazy. <laughs> it's totally a thing. Okay, yeah. Where, where the yeah, where the light cycles through a rainbow really quickly. You're doing like a aggressive cycling. Yeah. Yeah, you like a you look like a party wizard. Just need a staff. <laughs> and a, a cape thingy, a, a robe with a hood, a hooded robe, as it were. Hooded robe. Wow, there you go. Wow, that's aggressive. It's so distracting. I do like the idea of just being at a party while grading. Yeah. <laughs> Should do that for a happy hour. Just like Ooh. all get lights. Now you're laughing. <laughs> we, can, we can all be like that. I so hate dealing with insurance. Yeah, the worst. Yeah, it's unfortunate. Wait a minute. Why can't I hear you? Uh oh. I don't know. I can hear him. Wait. Not a dream. It's all oh. the lights. Yeah, maybe the lights are you're blinded by the lights. Um, yeah. And I'm able to think. Oh, there you are. Yeah, my wife got these like. Can't see them. Nope. Okay. Can't see shit. <laughs> Hold on. Oh, that's so much. I feel like that's an Amazon thing. No, yeah, for sure. That's like the most Amazon thing that's ever. Cool. Actually, that I, I, feels I, like a Twitter ad. Like. <laughs> Pretty sick. <laughs> and then I got my little, I got a little phone holder. It holds my phone. So I just set them up on that <laughs> and aim them right in my face. I'm blinded by the light. Blinded by the light. Blinded by the light. <laughs> oh. Now I get to put 99 bugs in the oh. code. Let us close the rooms. Close them. I got it. Oh, look, I said it for 10 seconds. Yeah. Yay. It's a party. We're having a party. We're, it's party time in the oh, FBI boy. room. Party time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. so much, by the way. <laughs> that filter really just makes fun. me think of the Willy Wonka tunnel. I love that movie. That scary part. Yeah. <laughs> That's it's one such with an the amazing maggot. scene. Oh, God. It's funny because that probably cost an amazing amount of money whenever it was actually done, and now you can just like buy a $5 thing off of Amazon and get the same exact effects. That's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> All right. How did we do? Did anyone come up with a solution? I see thumbs ups. Cool. Okay. 
let's walk through it. So what we did to solve this, uh, we first needed a controller's directory. We don't have any controllers yet to hook up a movies controller to. So, or this movies router rather. So first we need to start by making a new directory called controllers. And then inside of that directory, we need to touch controllers slash movies.js. Again, this should be pluralized here. We were exporting multiple controllers from this movies file. And then in here, we don't need access to the model yet, so we don't technically need to bring that in. We'll do that later. Uh, right now, all that we need is to have a function called, uh, I believe, new. Let's see what the chart says. It's going to say new. Uh, so if I swing over to chart, our typical controller action is new for this. But remember, new is a reserved word, so I need to call this new movie. It's going to take in rec. It's going to take in res. And we're going to console log. This works. And then let's make sure it works. We're going to export this. New movie as new. So my work in the controller is done, but my work in my router isn't. Now that I've done that, I need to import everything from the movies uh, controller as movies, hello, movies control from, and then we need to link to this. We need to leave the routes directory go into the controllers directory and then use the movies.js file. Now everything is happy. And if I swing over to our new add movie link that we've got here, we will see this console log here. Anybody have any questions at all about that? Very good. Cool. So this is our entire process here that got us a uh, move, new movie function in our controllers. What we're going to do next is actually build out the UI that we are going to render whenever we have a hit on this route. Right now we're just running this console log. The next thing we need to do is actually build out this view for our user. So therefore, we need to switch up our function here. Instead of just a console log, let's res.render a new file. And we can see again in our chart exactly what we needed to add here. This needs to link up to a movies new dot ejs file. So we're going to render movies slash new. And that's it. Except one vital piece. What am I missing here? What does this view need access to? The title. The title. The title. Yes, exactly. Every single view that we write is going to have a title. Um, now here, it is important that we're matching what our nav partial is expecting. Because remember, I want this to be contextual to this title that I have right here. Whenever the title is add movie, I want to change this class name so that it is active. So, therefore, what I'm going to need to make sure that I'm doing is setting this as the title. So let's do that. Um, here, what I'm going to do, just copy this directly from out of the nav. No reason to not do that. Let's set that as the title.
Uh, I can split this across lines if I want. I don't have to though. I'm going to go ahead and do that though. Just so it looks like the lecture. Okay. I'm telling my server to render this view. If I go here now, if I click on this link, what is the error that I'm going to get? 404. Mm -hmm. Close. Uh, view not found or something like that. Exactly. We failed to look up view movie slash new in the views directory. We don't have a movies new.ejs file yet. So let's do that. I'm going to do make dir views movies. And then I'm going to touch views movies new.ejs. Now I have a movies new.ejs file. If I refresh this, I don't have an error anymore. I'm not displaying anything, but I don't have an error. Now, this is where partials are going to save us because it is going to be so easy for us to compose views now. Boom. I have copied this from the existing index.ejs file and I've brought it over here into my movies new.ejs file. And I have a composed view. What's wrong with this though? I have one There's little tiny, tiny thing. Uh, not what I'm looking for, but yes, that's Your correct. File path isn't correct. Yes, 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 yes. This is a really common error that people will make during the lab is once we've constructed this index.ejs, it's really easy to copy all the stuff out of here. That's what you should be doing. But we do need one small fix on this because this index.ejs lives inside of this views directory. We just go into partials. But for our movies directory, when we're in our new.ejs file, we need to leave this directory and get into the views directory. So instead of dot slash, what I need here is dot dot slash. And now I have my partial constructed or my view constructed using my partials. Just so you all can see what this will look like if I don't link this up properly. This is the error that you will see. We could not include this file. That means that this doesn't exist. You're trying to add something that we don't have access to. So we've got a link to the correct thing that makes our error go away. And we now have an ad movie page. We can see that our style is working up here as well. Remember when we're not on this ad movie page, this is going to be that darker color. Whenever we are on the ad movie page, it's going to be white. So our little magic that we're doing in our nav partial is working. Here, the class of this is going to be active because we are on the page that has the ad movie title. When we're not on this page, there's not going to be a class of active on this. It's just going to be that gray color. Uh, Callum, yes. We might have gone over this a while ago, but why are views not in the public directory such that uh, we could take advantage of the file pathing being consistent all the time? And I'm sure other things. Yeah. Let's think about this. Why are they not in the public directory? If we don't have them, if we have them in our views directory, this is where express knows to look for a view express inherently knows that this views directory exists it knows this that, that this views directory is special now i could go in and there's actually a piece of code i could use that would overwrite that and would say hey instead of using this as the views directory let's use another file as the uh, or another directory as the views directory where we will serve our views from but our issue with that is that all of these things that are here need to be composed by our actual 
server, right? Um, we could move these into public and then have these all exist on, um, let's say, um, an actual route. Uh, so, bah, 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 bah. so that's not what I want. I want a controller function. So if I moved those into the public directory, these might live on like slash. Hello. This might live on like slash views slash uh, movies slash new dot EJS. This might be how I would write this potentially, but this is now a ton more work than I would necessarily need to do otherwise. And even within our views themselves, we still have issues of like we could do slash views slash partials. This would work. It would be fine. But now what we're having to do here is make a bunch of requests to be able to make this happen. This is going to say, make a request to this location to be able to do this. I am honestly not, I, I think this would work if you had a views directory in public and moved all of your views into that. But honestly, not too sure if you would be able to do something like this because I'm pretty sure that this is going to want a full uh, kind of a path that we've got here uh, because this is this is a file path that we are doing here not a URL path um, so what we would probably have to do is something that looks more like HTTP going slash slash local host 13000 slash view slash partials this would probably work pretty sure that this would work but now, once we deploy, this is all broken and things are sad and blah, 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 right? So that is Terrible why... Terrible idea. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> cool. um, theoretically, it would work, potentially, but I, I, this feels much better to me. <laughs> all right. Uh, let me make sure that this is correct again. Nick, yes. Is that something that's consistent across all um web frameworks or like 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 express like if we start using something different uh, is like in a stack is that going to be something that's consistent or, or is it gonna, each each one going to have its own little quirks like that what are you referring to specifically uh express so the fact that express looks in views is that something oh, like oh, if oh, we're oh, using yes. something other than express great question um not necessarily uh, so this will be, this is a decision that express has made that, Hey, if I want to serve up a view, it's going to be in the views directory. Um, that is just how this is written. Um, okay. someone made that decision a long time ago and now therefore today, that is what we have. Um, the, the thing that you'll run into is that this is a very common pattern though, where, we know that we want to serve up views from somewhere, right? What we call that might be different. Uh, for example, Django serves views up from what are called templates, um, which is super confusing because we already know templates from <laughs> other things, but um, it'll use that templates name instead of a views name. Um, so something to kind of, it, while this pattern may not exist exactly in other things it is a pattern that does exist very commonly okay and what, what was the i'm sorry what was the name of like what express is again uh a web application framework web application framework okay thank you yep totally all right <clears throat> so um we have a partial constructed here or a view constructed my brain is going to try to find all of the words for views now. Okay, so um, what we need to do first, I've got this main here and we can see that this is working kind of as we want it to, but this view is going to have its own specific CSS. And it's going to come from this forms.css file. And you recall in our templates or our partials that we've constructed in HTML head, we're not closing our head tag until the nav. That's when we close this. So whenever we're looking 
at our new.ejs, whenever we're between lines one and three here, we're still inside of the head tag. And we can do anything in here that we want that would go into the head. We could write a script here. We could attach this to a script. We could attach this to a piece of uh, CSS. We might want to include other functionality from maybe a library that would be specific to this page. Maybe I only want to use our, um, our icon here on this specific page. Well, if that was the case, then this is where I could put that kind of information. Anything that we would put into the head that will be unique to this page exists here between when we close our HTML head and when we open our nav.ejs. So for us, in this case, this is going to be slash style sheets, slash movies, slash forms.css. Because again, everything that is in this public directory has a route constructed for it whenever we start up our app. Therefore, we're able to search on slash style sheets, slash movies, slash forms.css. So let's check this out. And we'll see that everything right now looks exactly the same. What we're adding in here is this little bit of CSS for our forms. Just giving everything some consistent sizing as we're working on this stuff. We're also using grid here to display our form so that our form kind of is laid out in this grid pattern. This is a fun little, because we don't really talk about grid too much, this is a fun little like quick um, exploration into that. Feel free to dive into this in kind of your own time as you're working with this and how grid is set up in this way. All right, so um, let's go ahead in our main tag. What we're going to do is build out this form. Got a title here. Let's do a form. For now, I'm going to go ahead and give this an ID. We'll call this new form. And our action here is going to be empty, and our method here is going to be empty. We'll determine these things later. Now, there's a ton of stuff here. I'm not going to write all of this. There's going to come a point where this is not valuable to spend a bunch of time writing it. I will write this one, though, just so we can kind of see how this form is laid out. So we're going to have a label here. A label is something that describes an input. So for example, our label here is going to be for our title input. And the text here is just going to say title. And then we're going to have an input. Its type is going to be text. We're going to give it a name of title. We'll talk about this here in a moment. Why we're giving it this specific name, title. And you'll see here that our ID title input matches what we have here in four. To tie this label to this input, this is how this goes. We say four equals and then whatever the ID of our input is. That ties these two elements together. It binds them. There are other ways that we can bind inputs here as well, labels and inputs together. For example, I can put this input inside of this label. This is another way to bind these together. Whenever I do this, I don't need the for because we know kind of intrinsically this input is inside of this label. Therefore, this input must be tied to this label. OK, 
Kelsey, yes. So if you, is there any difference in the way that it'll display in our browser if you code those two, like, is it going to like put title inside of the actual input field or something instead of next to it? Great question. So that's in this case going to be dependent upon our CSS. Our CSS here is going to um, actually display these in a very specific way, which is why we've written our HTML constructed in this also kind of specific way. Um, here, if I um, if I just do this and there's no CSS attached at all to any of this that is happening here, um, it will display, I believe, exactly the same. I'm pretty sure that our label here is going to be a, um, let's see, is label an inline element? I honestly don't remember. Label block. Yes. Block level elements. Label. Label is not a block element. Therefore, this will look exactly the same no matter how I do this. Cool. Thank you. I was uh, just at really least, curious. At least if we don't have CSS styling, excluding right. that. <laughs> All right. Uh, so let me undo this because we do have some styling here, which is dependent on our input being outside of our label. Now that we've kind of talked about what this label is doing and how it is getting tied to this input, let's talk about the title that we've got here next. Name set to title. Why does this matter? Why is this important? It has to align with the schema. Yes, 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 exactly. Perfect. So in our movie model, we can see that we've got our schema here. This title will come from the input that we've got up here. This is where the user is going to input the title for the movie. And because we've given it a name of title, our server is going to know whenever it receives this data that whatever the user has put into this box is the title of the movie. Again, you're informing the user with the label. You're informing the server with the name. All right, so from there, let's go ahead and um, we're actually, uh, we're at time here and I really want to, mm, I don't want to split this up. Uh, we're going to eat into a little bit more lunch. Sorry about that. Um, let's build another label. I'm not going to write all of this out though. Uh, so we'll, uh, be able to get out of here somewhat soon. So this will be our release year input. And this will be tied to a release year. And now I need a corresponding input for that. Our input is going to be a text input. Our name for this is going to be release year. And the ID is going to be release year input. Uh, Steven, yes. Uh, shouldn't the type be number for the release year as we've, or is it always text for inputs? Great question. So that's what I was going to hit on here. So here we're putting this as text. And even if we put this as number, you'll remember this from your unit one assessment. What did you have to do whenever you wanted to add the two inputs together? We had to turn them, turn one into a string. You had to turn one into a number. So we had to be able to add those two things together. We had to take what was in the input and turn it into a number. That's going to be the case even if I put type number here. This is still going to come across to my server as a string. So in this case, it doesn't really matter. Um, you can use a number input if you wanted to here. That just gives you the little like up and down arrows on the side of this. Um, you can do that. You don't have to. Um, you do get a little bit of like contextual stuff around that too with you can set minimums and maximums and all of that fun stuff, but we're just going to set this as text for simplicity. All right, next. 
Next, we're going to have a drop down uh, for our MPA rating. I'm just going to copy that from right out of the lecture. We know how labels work at this point. Let's go ahead and write this um, this drop down though. To be able to make a drop down, you have a select element. We're again going to give this a name that corresponds with our schema, MPAA rating. And it's going to have an ID of this MPAA rating select. So this is how we create a dropdown. And your options for this dropdown will exist inside of the option tag. And you'll see that we need to give these a value and a display. But those are typically, at least in this case, going to align. We'll have an option for G, for PG, for PG-13, and also for R. Uh, to duplicate these items, by the way, I am hitting... Uh, option shift down. Uh, if you are on Windows or Linux, that will be control shift down. That will duplicate your current line uh, downwards. If you would do up, it will duplicate it upwards. So here we have a drop down with these four items inside of it. Let's talk about why we're giving this a value and putting the same thing in the actual display. Similar to how, uh, recall earlier, our title that we're displaying here, this label is for our user and the name for this input is for our server. We have a very similar idea going on here. What we put inside of this option is for our user, what we actually display. The value of this is for our server. This is how we will receive this on the other side, on the server side, is whatever the value of the option that your user has selected is. Here, these will align. You will definitely see places where this doesn't align. We'll get to that later on. All right, so these other ones, I'm just going to copy on over. Uh, we have another text input, and then we have a uh, checkbox that we are going to be doing. You recall earlier I said for now, we're going to do our cast as comma separated values. We're telling our user, we have to inform our user, hey, separate these actors that we're doing with commas as you're putting them in. There are a lot of different ways that this can be interpreted, and we're going to see how this is wildly fragile and a very bad way of doing this. But it is going to be our first step. Or it'll be our first iteration of this. We'll come back and make this better later once we know how to make it a little bit better. But for now, this is how we're going to do this. This is just a text input. Finally, we've got our checkbox with a label like we've had. And our difference here is that our type here instead of text is going to be checkbox. And you'll also see that we have this checked that is here. Checked will indicate that this box will be checked whenever we come to this page. We have one last item that we need, a button. It's going to be of type submit. And the text that is in here is going to be add movie. Let's go check out our page. And here it is. You'll see that our item of note here, we have a drop down that is here, and we have now showing, which is checked. Everything else here is just going to be a regular old text input. Any questions about this? Yes, Musto. Um, maybe I just didn't see it before, but 
I, when I was making, or when, when we were in unit one, um, I noticed that those inputs didn't have like, oh, cause I have dash lane, like the dash lane extension. So it'll just like auto fill things. And I mm -hmm. noticed that on this one, on the inputs, it'll, it has it on there, but on the prior ones, it didn't. Maybe I, maybe I'm wrong there, but uh, is, is there a reason why that, why that's like that? Yeah, that is coming from the name. So whatever we, what that means, whenever you have this uh, availability here to autofill something, it means that you have previously put something into an input that has been named title. Uh, and that is what is showing here in your, um, in the actual title that we've got. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. And that's why you're getting that autofill. Yes, Ian. Just a friendly time check for you in case you haven't looked at it. Yeah, yet. I know. Okay, cool. Just make it here. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Sorry. That's my question. Thank you. Uh, Steven, yes. Uh, actually, this can wait. This isn't super important. If you don't okay. mind, just no, waiting for cool. a few seconds. Yeah, yeah that's totally fine. Cool. All right. Uh, I am going to do, dismiss you all here. Thanks for sticking around uh, for a little bit of your lunch. I'll give you a little bit of time back. I'll give you an extra eight minutes for lunch. Be back at 20 after. So that'll be an hour and eight minute lunch. Um, thanks again for sticking around with me. Um, have a good lunch. And if you have questions, stick around and I'll answer them. Um, I just wanted to say my styling does not look like yours. Did oh, I okay, miss cool. a step? Um, at the very top here, do you have a link to a style sheet with this href? In my new dot, da, 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 da. I thought it would because I copied it over from. Oh, no, I don't. Okay, thank you. No problem. Uh, I am pushed, by the way, if anyone needs this code. David, uh, I forgot about the. Oh, sorry, Nick. But... No, 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 no. I, I was just uh, going to share a, a kind of an aha moment that I had. Um, oh, please. When, when you were explaining the uh, how the the I I don't have the where's the chart. The uh, post put patch delete. Mm -hmm. How that's how that's up just for the server. I was gonna. I was gonna. I was like. I I couldn't wrap my mind around how all of this was happening without having the EMV the access to the database. But mm -hmm. this is all just this is all just the user interaction on the HTML page and not actually manipulating the database whatsoever. But when exactly. there's any sort of manipulation, you have the EMV uh, in order to access the database. Yep. Okay. Exactly. That's super important too. Once we get into like completely splitting up our front end and our back end, being able to conceptualize like what is the domain of the front end and like what is actually <laughs> the domain of the back end and how we can have them. It's like completely separate entities is really important because right now they're all kind of combined into one folder structure, but eventually we're going to split those apart. And I think that's like a, a big moment. So keep, keep that in your mind. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now, now I'm interested how those two interact. It'll be fun. You'll see. You'll yeah. see. <laughs> okay. It'll be a good time. Have a good lunch. You too. You too. Have a good one. David, I was like, um, I assume our recording so we don't lose anything. All righty. So, um, what we are uh, going to do now is uh, actually handle the second uh, request that is going to be made here. So, again, uh, just to cover this again, the create that we are implementing here is a two-step process. The first step is show the user the form where they can actually input the stuff. That's this right here. This is what we've done so far. The next part of this is going to be us actually submitting this form. That's where the second request here is going to come into play. So the user is going to come to this page. They're going to fill out this form. They're going to input everything that they want. And then they're going to come back, add to this movie, and a second request will be made. Whenever they submit this form, then what we have written here in our movie's new, this right here, this action and this method will fire off. We haven't quite written this yet, but we will very soon. Right now, whenever we submit this form, it doesn't really do anything. So 
let's go ahead and implement our second step. For this, this is going to require a post request to slash movies. That is where we will create a new movie. Our controller action is going to be create. It will have a data payload. That means there will be something on rec.body. And after this, we are going to redirect wherever we want to go. Note again here, we've kind of been spending some of today talking about the difference between what's happening with a get and what's happening with a post put 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 patch or delete note here that whenever we're getting we're always res dot rendering something res dot render res dot render res dot render res dot render always whenever we're making a get request whenever we res dot render that means show this thing to the user send the user this whenever we're redirecting these are our database actions Remember that these don't actually show anything to the user. These are for us. And we're going to redirect to whatever route that we want the user to actually load some sort of thing on. Typically, that will be either one of these top two get requests where we read all of the movies or read a specific movie. That's typically going to be the action here. Could we build something where we redirect to slash new movie slash new. Absolutely. We totally could. That's actually where we're going to start with this functionality because it's the only thing that exists. This might be useful if say we want the user to be able to continually add things into this database and we don't want the user to have to like click around on our site to be able to get to this form. We just want the user to be able to submit the form and submit another form and submit another form, submit another form. That way, whenever we have something written like that, that's going to speed up the user side process here. If that is the action that we want to take place. Again, we can redirect literally anywhere we want to. We could redirect away from our site entirely if we wanted to. This is up to us. So, again, we've currently implemented this functionality down here. What we're going to implement next is the actual thing that is going to create a new movie in our database. So let's do that. This will require a post request to slash movies. So back over in our form, we can go ahead and start by building the UI that's going to issue that request. That is this form. When the user clicks this button, this form does what it's supposed to do. It sends this data that the user has put in to slash movies using a post request. What we're going to do next is define the route on the actual server itself. So we've already built our movies router. What we just need to do in here is add in a new route post on localhost 3000 slash movies, and that's it. Router.post to the slash route, movies control dot, and then what are we going to be calling? We can go to the chart for that answer. What is the typical controller action going to be for this? Create. So movies control dot create exactly. Okay, cool. Next thing I want to do is build out this function so that I'm able to test this to make sure that it works. Now, how my indentation got off there. That's okay. We're going to write a function called create. It's going to accept rec res. Let's Again, do our little sanity check. And make sure that this works. So whenever I click on this button, uh, hold on. 
I still have an error. I need to export my function that I just wrote. There we go. Now we are no longer crashed. Whenever I click on this button, this add movie button, I should see this console log. Let's check it out. Um, actually, hold on. That's incorrect. I need to refresh first. Uh, whenever I click on this button now, now I should see create works. Sorry about that. Got to refresh because we changed what has happening in our EJS. So again, little baby Sandy checks along the way. All that I did to make this work is hook up my actual action and method here in my form, build a route that matches that, and then hook that up to a controller function. That's all we've done so far. Again, the Sandy check makes us kind of uh, do checks along the way and understand that the code that I've written so far works. So I have, if I have bugs, it's going to be in what I write next. So remember that this has, if we look at our chart, a payload. This has a data payload. What is that data payload going to be on? What do I have access to in my controller function? The movie model? That's where I'm going to put what I have access to. Where's this data? Is it where rec dot params. Eh, so close. Rec dot body. Yeah, rec dot body. Yes. Whenever I have form data, form data always forever is going to come across on rec dot body. So here, if I do a quick console log of rec dot body, let's see the data that we have for funsies. Why not do this? Just to demonstrate what is on rec.params in this case. Let's try this. I'm going to hit our slash movies route one more time by clicking add movie here. And we are going to see here, I have an object. I didn't put anything into this form, so therefore it's a bunch of empty strings. I do have an NPA rating, and now showing is set to on. That's fun. We'll talk about that here in a moment. And then we can see here that rec.params, or ret comma params as I've written it by accident, uh, this is empty. There is nothing on rec.params. Why is that? Why do we not have rec.params? Anybody? Take a stab? Is it... I don't know how to word it. Params only come through the get request? Mm -hmm. Not quite. Uh, Although, in our case, uh, eh, typically, yes. But that's not... We could technically send them on a post, too. How we have the chart... How the chart is written, it doesn't come across on anything but a get. But we could have rec.params on a post if we really wanted to. Is it that that's where we're... That's when we're sending it? Um, where I guess what is the difference of we that we have here in the location of where we are pulling data off of? Pulling it off the browser, but we don't have we're not calling anything with the rec dot params. We're pulling it from where's the how is the browser how. Are we receiving what the browser has sent? We have it here already. What is that on? The form data.
on the body. Exactly. Rect.body. body. That's where the form data is. How do we have rect.params? params? Whenever we have rect.params, params, where is that coming from? The URL. Yes, exactly. Exactly. It's coming from the route. So here, because I don't have a colon, whatever, whatever, I don't have rect.params dot whatever. We only have params whenever, at least in our case, whenever we want to capture an ID off of a route. That is why we would have params in our case. But we don't have that here. So we don't we don't have colon anything on any of this. Therefore, we aren't capturing rect.params at all. So our form data is here. on rec.body. So let's take a look at what we have on this. Let's actually submit a movie here. Um, let's go ahead. Um, I'm going to do the movie Arrival, which I honestly have no idea when this came out. Maybe 2016? Who knows? Um, probably PG-13, I guess. Um, let's say some people... All right, so let's go ahead and submit this data as we have it. I'm going to add this movie, and we can see here is what our server receives. Now, first thing that I want to point out here is all of this stuff, everything here is a string. That is how our server is going to receive it. Even if I switch new.ejs, uh, if I come in here, I set release here as a number, kind of as we discussed a little bit earlier. Uh, say I refresh this. Now arrival will have a release here of 2016. We'll notice that there is a little, uh, there's a little uh, spinner over here that we can use to select which year that we want. Even if I click add movie here, even though we've listed the type here as number, this still arrives on our server as a string. So that's kind of our first item of note. Everything our server receives is going to be a string. The next thing that we're going to note is look at now showing. Whenever this checkbox is checked, what the server is receiving is on. But if I uncheck this, click Add Movie. Let me stop this previous request. Click Add Movie. Look at what we have now. If you went to Ben's thing yesterday, you probably saw a little preview of this because you were able to edit things. Uh, and as part of editing, there, I believe there was a checkbox involved and you would have checked that or unchecked that to mark something as done or not done. So you've probably seen a little preview of kind of what is going on here if you went to that. If not, no big deal. But here you can see that we have this. Whenever we have this checkbox checked, now showing is coming through is on. When we don't have the checkbox checked, we don't even receive now showing. So... What we can do to handle this over on our server. Is we can check and see, does now showing exist? And if it does, give me a Boolean value. Remember, that's what we want to put into our database, right? Uh, if we look at our movie model, now showing should be a Boolean value. So we have quite a bit of data manipulation to do here. And the way that we're going to handle this is actually with something that we've covered a little bit before, and that is the uh, kind of double bang or bang bang from uh, our uh, kind of our ability to change something to a Boolean value. So 
what this is going to look like, I swing back over to the lecture. Is this code here? Rec.body.now showing. Remember, I can manipulate this rec.body object however I want to before we actually save it to the database. I'm going to set this equal to bang bang rec.body.now showing. Let's look real quick at what we get out of this. Um, let's say if I just do the single bang here. You recall that this bang will coerce whatever value is here to a truthy or a falsy value. So let's check out rec.body.now showing. Move this down here as well. We'll look at this before and after. So if I go back, I submit this again. Uh, potentially, there we go. All right. Check out this right here. Before, whenever I don't have this checked, let's make a little chart here. Um, this is not what I want. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba. I have, um, let's say, checked. I can totally do better than this, actually. Let me give me one hot second. So we have a couple of states that this can exist in. And once Excel starts, I'll be able to show them to you. All right, so we have It's a little bit bigger, so we're able to see. So we have checkbox states over here. The checkbox can be checked or it can not be checked. These are the two options that we have in the checkbox. Whenever this comes on rec.body.checked, or sorry, rec.body. Now showing. What we get here when it's checked is the string on. Whenever it is not checked, rec.body. Now showing is undefined. We've determined this already. So if I look at bang rec.body.now showing whenever this is whenever the checkbox is checked this is going to be false sorry true whenever this is undefined Actually, this does not seem right. Hold on one moment. Make sure we're in a good spot. Let's add this movie. Okay, cool. So rec.body dot now showing is true. Uh, whenever this is uh, undefined, whenever this has not been checked, that is what we have right now. If I check this, submit this request again, we can see that rec.body after doing bang rec.body.now showing, this is set to false. Remember, I'm console logging it. So this is false. So remember what we want. What is our end goal? I want to be able to put a Boolean value into our database. I have a Boolean value here, but this is the inverse of what I want it to be, right? Whenever I have this checkbox checked, this is switching from the value of on to false. 
and undefined to true. So this is going to look like whenever the user has not checked this box, if I just do bang rec.body.now showing, we get the wrong Boolean value here. We get the opposite value that we want. Remember this bang here is coercing whatever is in this location into a Boolean value, but it's also saying not. So it's switching this truthy value to false and it's switching this tr falsy value to true. So we can have another bang here. We can do bang bang rec.body.now showing to get the inverse of this Boolean value. So I can say, bang, bang, rec.body.now showing. And if I do this, what we're going to see, whenever I submit this form and the checkbox is checked, now, whenever the checkbox is checked on rec.body.now showing, I have true. And whenever I stop this, uncheck this, submit this form again, now I get false. So now what we have on rec.body.now showing is going to be aligned with the state that we that our user selected back over in the browser. This is ultimately what we want out of this. When the user has not checked something, we want rec.body.now showing to be false. When the user has checked something, we want rec.body.now showing to be true. So here, what we're doing is called massaging our data. We are making the data kind of coerce into the form that we want it to be before we actually insert it into our database. Now, is this something I would kind of expect you all to be able to come up with on your own? No, not at all. So if you're like looking at this and you'll be like, I would never come up with that. Yeah, you wouldn't. <laughs> That's totally fine. Um, I And again, this is how you can do every single checkbox that you ever write. Because this will always get you your correct checkbox state over in the browser. It will align your data, what we ultimately put into the database, rec.body.now showing, with what the user has actually intended to do. Nick, question, yes. So can we can we can we essentially turn any variable into a Boolean with it equal to itself with a bang. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Yep. You can coerce any value at all into a Boolean with the bang. Now, remember that this is, this is the not operator. What this is going to do whenever you use one of them is if it is a truthy value, it's going to make it false. It will be a false value. If it is a falsy value, it will become true. So, just keep that in mind as you're using this. One bang is going to get you the inverse, but if you do the bang bang here, that's going to get you from a truthy value to true and from a falsy value to false. Again, this is a kind of solved problem. This is something that you can use and now on any checkboxes that you create, you can use the same exact piece of code just by switching out rec.body dot whatever to whatever it is that you're trying to uh, make an actual Boolean value. So this works, this code works on any checkboxes that you create. Any other questions about this? This is kind of weird. This is interesting and fun, but... Um, this is just how this code is going to be written.
Cool. All right. With that out of the way, what we're going to do is look next into massaging our second piece of data. And what we did here in our browser is tell the user here, we are going to put the cast, separate the actors with commas. Don't know who any of the actors or actresses in this movie are. I have simply written some people here. But I need a way to be able to split this up. Because what I'm going to put into my database eventually is going to be an array of cast members kind of separated out. So how I've submitted some people here. So let's say cast. So what I'm going to submit is going to be the string of some and people. And then my final cast that I put into the database, I'm going to want to look like some people. So I need to, again, massage this data that I have and turn it into this. This is what I want to actually put into my database. So the way that we're going to do that is first check and see if this even exists. If rec.body.cast, then what I'm going to do is rec.body.cast. And here I'm actually going to do a string method to turn this single string into an array of strings. This will be rec.body.cast.split. And how I'm going to split these up are by commas, a comma and a space specifically. This here will transform our cast from this single string into an array of strings. This is probably something that if I gave you a pretty good prompt on and said, hey, go do this, you could probably come to a good solution for this potentially eventually, right? Um, th this is something you would probably be able to grasp a little bit easier on your own and be able to like understand like, hey, this is what's going on here. So um, this, while temporary though, I will say is pretty rough. Um, there's a lot of things that can go wrong here. Um, for one, there's a lot of mis misinterpretation that your user can make here. Write the cast member, separate the actors with commas. If I take this literally as a person, I might not put a space here, right? That breaks this split that we're doing entirely. Now, what I would do, um, this will be a, uh, let's say I have some people. What will result out of this is, even after this split here, an array of some people. It'll be in an array, but these strings you can see are not split. Again, this is a very, very fair interpretation of what we're asking our user to do here. The more that you're causing your user to think, the more that they're probably going to do the wrong thing. So we could add specific instructions here of, hey, make your cast look like this. Probably not going to change that at the end of the day, you're going to get some wonky stuff in this box. So this is why we will come back here and refactor how this looks later. This is a really good opportunity for us to kind of talk about, though, how um, you know this is a component of user experience. Even how you lay out your data can determine if your users have a good experience using your site or a bad experience. It's not just about like, oh, let's make things look pretty on the front end. It's, hey, we need to think and be cognizant of how our users are going to use this site and how they're going to input data into this app.
So anyway, like I said, this is a super temporary method. We'll come back here and make this much better later on. But these are the kinds of things that you should be thinking of as you're building out your applications. So now at this point, let's check out, uh, let's do a log of rec.body again, just so we can see our massage data and how it looks before we're actually going to save it to our database. And we're looking pretty good now. We have this object here. Everything is looking correct. We have our cast as an array of strings. We have now showing as an actual Boolean value. I will say here, our release here is still a string. But you'll recall the, what our uh, model is expecting. Model, 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 hello model. What our model is expecting is a number. This is okay though. Mongoose can handle a very simple kind of uh, conversion like this, just like JavaScript can't. If we need to coerce this 2016 into a number, Mongoose will totally do that for us. No big deal at all. So we don't need to really worry about doing anything with this piece of data. But this here is going to be our completed object. Let's go ahead and save this into our database. To do that, we're going to use the create method, just like we've done before. So we're going to say movie dot, uh-oh, I don't have movie here. I need to import my model. So let's bring in our movie model to import movie from our movie model. Model slash movie dot JS. Now that I've imported the movie model, I can actually create a new movie. Movie.create. And then the object that I'm going to use here is this object that I've got here. This is the data that I want to base my new movie off of. So I'll have movie.create uh, rec.body. All right. So then after this point, I will get back a movie. And I'm going to redirect back to slash movies slash new. I can also log any errors here with a catch. Notice how I'm using an abbreviation for error here now instead of writing out all of error. If you want to write out the full error name, feel free. As long as you can determine that this is an error, you are good. So let's log our errors when we have them. And let's do a redirect back to slash movies slash new. All right. Any questions about this? Anything that we've done with this controller function? You'll note here that we're not using the movie that we get off of this. We're simply redirecting. We could, for example, log this movie here if we wanted to. Totally possible. We're not doing that although we are now, but with how this is written already, we're not making use of this movie, although it is available to us. I'm going to log this, though, just so we can see it as we create it. Let's go ahead and add this movie. And here we can see our object as we sent it to the database. This is what we sent. And then the document, the actual movie document that we created that we're console logging right here on line 17 looks like this. There's a lot of cool stuff in here that we actually didn't have to touch or add ourselves. We still have the title. 
We have the release year coerced into a number. We have all of our data as it was supposed to go in. Everything was good there. And then we had this underscore ID. This was automatically generated for us. This is our object ID. And then we have when this was created and updated at. Note here that these times are exactly the same. Remind me why we have access to created at and updated at. We added it into we, the schema. Yeah. Exactly. And to our options object in our schema, we have this timestamps true. That is what gets us this created at and updated at. And note that we don't have to maintain any of these values as we go. Whenever this document is updated later on, this updated at will automatically change to whatever time that this was updated at. You'll see in here that we have this full timestamp here. Note the time, though. This is a 24-hour clock instead of a 12-hour clock. So this is saying that this was created for me at 5.58 p.m. That's clearly not the time that it is now. That is because whenever this was created, it was created using UTC time. Kind of alluded to this yesterday a little bit, how time is really kind of a pain to work with. This here is a UTC timestamp. And if we wanted to display this for some reason in our local user's time zone, we would need to do a little bit of conversion to be able to make that happen correctly. Time is something you you can dig into this and you can spend a ton of time on it. Um, huh. um, but I, I would not recommend doing that um, at this stage in your development career. Um, this is a huge rabbit hole that does not end. Um, time is, you can touch it, you can like play around with it if you would like, but I would not get any deeper than like skin deep on time at this point. But these values are still here for us to be able to use as we will. Uh, Steven, yes. Um, I double checked my schema and it has the timestamps, but it's not showing them. Oh, interesting. You're logging the movie, just making sure in your controller. Yes, I am uh, console logging movie. it. The let's created movie. Let's check it out. Yeah, yeah. Let's see. Oh no, okay. Um, I was doing rectal body. That's why. Oh, okay, cool. Cool, cool, cool. The other thing right. is how did you I must have missed it, but how did you uh coerce a string into a number for release? Uh we did it. Mongoose did this for us. Um, so whenever we sent this string into the database, it is going through, and this is this is a really good uh demonstration of this. Whatever data that gets put into the database is filtered through this model. So before this data, this object that I have here hits the database, it's checking to see, okay, cool, title's a string, cool, release here is a number. Oh, no, it's not. Let's coerce this into a number if we can. If I put something here that's not a number, uh, if I do like this, I add this movie. Uh, I'm not going to be able to do that because this is not right. If I make this a text box instead of a number box, add this movie, woo, we get an error. This is a mongoose error. We haven't seen many mongoose errors before. But here, this error is being called because error, movie validation failed. Release here, cast to number failed for value, and then we have this string here, at path release here. This is Mongoose telling you, hey, you didn't give me a number. Like, I tried to coerce this string into a number, but it didn't work. You've done a bad thing. This is the type of error that you're going to want to look out for as you're working with this type of stuff. Um, cool. 
Uh, this actual like number over here is a great kind of validator on our front end to be able to check for this. So that's a interesting field to be able to turn into a number here. We'll kind of see how validation is going to work here in a moment, actually. Uh, Nick, question. Yeah, so I'm just kind of curious about coercion in general because it, we, with the on, on's not coerced into a Boolean value, even though Correct. we specify that it should be a Boolean value. And it seems like it would work with on and undefined. So is it is it just with uh, numbers and strings? That's it as far as coercion goes? Basically numbers and strings. If we had like say true and false as a string here for now showing, um, if we were somehow to get that, those values would actually be coerced into Boolean true or Boolean false. Um, if we had string of true, string of false there, that would be another thing that would coerce. Um, it, coercion is something that just kind of happens within JavaScript. And it's something like we could sit here and talk all day about like this will coerce, this won't coerce, this is how this thing coerces, like so on and so forth. Um it is something to kind of be aware of, and it's something that benefits us here in this case where, hey, I've got a string here, but it'll very easily coerce into a number, um, and we don't have to worry about it. Okay, so just m memorize the different cases where it works, not necessarily a rule that it follows. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Musto. Uh, I noticed when you were typing in the uh, release here, or when you were typing in the letters, uh, and then you hit add movie, it said, uh, this must be a number, like a little message. Yes. Is that something you added yourself, or is that something that one of the dependencies like have installed? Great question. So that is happening here because this was set at as type number at the time. So whenever this is type text, you can put whatever you want here. If this is type number, and I try to submit this now, please enter a number. So whenever this okay, is type cool. number, this is going to prevent the user from being able to put in anything here that is not a number at least at first glance and we'll talk about that here in a moment cool, thanks. uh steven sorry really quick is that a dependency or is that just baked into html this is just how html works thank you of course all righty Um, what we should be able to do go ahead and make sure that you've created a couple of movies in your database uh so what you're what I want to do is have a couple of things that you are able to use. Um, let's put in, oh boy, uh, 2001. Okay, wow, that's terrifying that I just recalled that. Um, okay, there's our MPA rating, our cast, um, Lee Murphy, and other people. Mike Myers. Ah, I love it. Mike Myers. M E Y. Cameron Diaz. Oh, wow. Really? Was she the... She's Fiona. Oh, wow. Huh. He's a good cast, man. Don't Amazing. forget John Lithgow as well. Come on, guys. I We're too far in now, and I can't type any more names. Um, physically Don't forget capable. Ben Manley. Oh, man. How could I forget? I'm so sorry, Ben. All right. So um let's go ahead this movie is not now showing let's add this movie make sure that you've made a couple of uh movies for yourself just so you have some data to work with as you're going through and um doing our next activity all right um one last little bit in here uh we're going to go ahead and hook this up to uh our azure extension so that we're able to see this so again swing back to your .env file and then we're going to need to bring up our command palette. We're going to do that with command shift P. Whoa, what just happened? Uh, we're going to do that with um, command shift P if you are on Mac OS or control shift P if you are on Windows or Linux. And then you should have up here towards the top of this recently used item for Cosmos DB, attach a database account. If you don't, that's totally fine. You can still search for it attach database, and it should be the only option that you have. You're going to click on that. You're going to click on MongoDB. And then you're going to paste in this new connection string that we have. Once you've done that, you can swing over to your Azure extension. And down in workspaces, you're going to look at your attached database accounts and then go into movies. You'll probably have to make this pretty wide so that you're able to see this. 
And you should see at this point, I have some movies. I have some movies that I've actually created before also. Turns out we use this database uh, pretty often. So here are our movies. We've got, we can see the ones that we've added. And what we're going to do here is just check and make sure that we have everything that we want. We should have a couple movies in our database at this point. If we don't, let me know. Happy to help you out. Cool. Everybody's good? All right. Awesome. Okay. So from here, um, let's go ahead. We are going to... Um, I feel like I skipped something. No, I didn't. Okay, cool. So... What we're going to do is take a quick break. Um, I'll have you all come back here at 20 after, and then we will do a bit on reading data. And I'll split you all up into groups. You all can do some index functionality, and it'll be a fun time. All right. Uh, have a good break. We'll see you at 20 after. All right, so a couple of housekeeping things. Um, while you all were working on that, I was looking up a couple of answers to things. Um, so um, the issue that we are having with uh, the Azure extension and accessing Atlas is happening because of some changes on MongoDB's end uh, that will be resolved soon, quotes, um, by uh, the people that maintain this Azure extension. Um, so that is, I fix is in the work there. Um, in the meantime, uh, we can go ahead and continue accessing, modifying, doing anything with our data inside of Atlas itself. Uh, so that is probably how we will go about doing things kind of from here until uh, things have settled down on the Azure extension side of things. Uh, so that's, that's, kind of what our status is there. Uh, like I said, we'll probably put a hold on using the Azure extension and just use the Atlas extension or the Atlas extension, the Atlas website uh, to be able to manage all of uh, our different resources for that. Um, so um, that's kind of the status on things there. Um, Mike, as far as your like, hey, are we able to like kind of see things before we reset them fully? Um, still looking into that. I'll have an answer after this weekend. Have you pushed your code changes since we got back? Uh, since we got back, no, I have actually not changed my code at all. We're going to do a walkthrough here together of everything that you all should have kind of done as a group. So you can kind of, uh, so we can all kind of be in the same place as we go forward here. Uh, but I am right now I have the old version of our code. So just as a heads up there, but we'll go through and do a walkthrough of all of this together. Uh, which we're going to start now. So let's go ahead. And we're going to uh, take a quick look here at the functionality that you all were going to implement. So we are going to come in here and build out our movie list where we are able to read the data here. Very first action that we want to do, identify our RESTful route. So let's go ahead. We are going to swing over to the chart to do this. So the routes that we are going to land on here, we want to read all of the movies. So we should be making this request on slash movies and it'll be a get request that we are making. And we can see here that uh, as part of our CRUD, we will be reading all of the movies so this will be a read action. Our controller action is going to be index. And we are going to render our index view for movies. So let's go ahead. We are going to swing over into our, uh, our route uh, first. Or actually, 
uh, our nav rather, now that we've identified this route, and we are going to add the UI that is going to trigger the request on that route. I'm going to keep this kind of simple. I'm literally going to copy what we have here, make a new link. We want this to be displayed after add movies as per our wireframe. If you did this before, that's okay. Totally fine. Um, but our wireframe has this as coming after add movie. So here will be our all movies link. And again, this lives on slash movies. Our title that we pass to this page, let's call this all movies. This will matter later for whenever we build out this uh, controller function. We need to make sure we pass a title that is all movies to our movies route or the movies uh, view, rather. All right. Now, the next thing we need to do here is actually define our RESTful route and our routers. This will be a get request on localhost 3000 slash movies. And our route is going to look like this, router.get. We are making a get request on the slash route. And whenever we have a hit on this route, we're going to call our movies controller dot index function. We are then going to step up and export that movie controllers index action. Let's swing over here. We're going to write a function called index, taking in rec, taking in res. Let's go ahead and throw a console log in here. Hang all movies. And of course, export this function index. All right. Any questions about this? Cool. Let's test it out. Make sure it works. We're going to swing over to our site. Let's do a refresh. Click on all movies, and we should see a console log for getting all movies. From this point, what we needed to do is code our index action to actually use the movie model to be able to query for all movies. So we say movie.find, passing in our empty object. This will get us all of our movies. Then once we have our movies, we are going to res.render the movie, movies index.ejs page. And we are providing it with the movies we just retrieved and a title. So movies, colon movies, and then title as uh, this needed to be to make this match our nav.ejs, all movies. So let's set that up. All movies. Of course, we have a dot then, so we need a dot catch. Let's go ahead and write that. I'm just going to copy our existing one. We'll just have this redirect to the slash route for our app. This will just be our homepage if we have an error finding this page. All right. And again, just to confirm that this works, it's totally cool if we do a console log here of movies. And let's swing back over here, refresh this page. We will see, look at that. Here's all of our movies. We've confirmed that we have all of our movie data here. Pretty cool. All right. So next, what we need to do is we have this error here. Failed to look up view movies index in the views directory. This means I need to touch a view 
movies index.ejs file. And I'm going to start with what I provided you all with over here. This has all of our partials already all set up. It has a link to our CSS already set up. The rest of this, the rest of our work here, we are going to write a line of EJS to iterate all of the movies using a for each loop and then close that for each loop in this position down here on line 28. So we're going to say EJS each. That'll get us this handy shortcut. Of course, if we didn't have this, this would look like this. We would need to open a set of EJS. Again, we're not using a squid with ink here. We don't want to print out the fact that we're doing a for each loop. All that we're saying here is, hey, construct a for each loop. We care about the data that is inside of this. That's why we're doing this squid with ink in here for the movie title, its release year, rating, the cast, all of that stuff. So here, this will be movies dot for each movie. And then we'll open this up. And then here's our set of uh, our curly bracket and uh, all of that for our function to live inside of. And then we're going to close the for each loop here. What is movies here? Where did this come from? Why do I have access to movies? Because you passed it in your render function. Exactly. Yes, 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 yes. And my controller. Because we spent res probably 20 minutes not passing it to our render function. That's how I know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's how you know. That's perfect. That is the error that you want to run into here. If we don't pass this here, we don't have access to this data. We have to pass this to the view so that our index.ejs page knows that movies exist. If we don't pass this in our controller function, there's nothing here that says, oh, we have movies. We have to explicitly pass those movies that we've retrieved out of our database to this view. All right. We have one last thing to fix up here. We need to finish this ternary expression to display yep or nope. So we're going to do that. We'll display yes here or, oh well, or nope. With all of that work done, let's check it out. Let's see if this works. Local 3000 slash movies. I have a few uh, broken things over here for my database. That's no big deal. We can kind of ignore that. Uh, the items down here are the ones that were we've recently added. All right. We can also see over here, if I make this a little bit wider, again, this is kind of some broken data and we'll kind of fix this up at some point in our future. Uh, but here we have our table as it is set up here. We have a title, the release year, its rating, the cast members, and whether this movie is currently showing or not. Um, let's go ahead. Let's go ahead and look over in Alice on how to actually access this data. And while we're doing that, I'll get rid of this old uh, data that we've gotten here. That'll make this a little bit better. So to access this data in Atlas, you're going to need to be signed into MongoDB Atlas. You could just Google this, um, MongoDB Atlas. If you just Google it, should be this kind of uh, first item here, and we can sign in. Uh, if you signed up with Google or GitHub, you'll sign in with those. Um, I'm going to have to sign in with my uh, email, though.
and let's see, where is the one associated with this? Pretty sure it's this. So once you are logged in, to view our data, you're going to be able to go to this Browse Collections button that's right here. Click on that. And this will show you all of the different databases that you've set up. You're going to have a much smaller list than I have here. I have tons of different databases just from building stuff with people, right? Um, so you'll probably have maybe two or three items here. Um, what we're looking for on this list is movies. So again, just to walk through this one more time, once you've logged into MongoDB Atlas, you'll be on this database page and you're going to want to click on Browse Collections. That will take you to this place here where you are going to want to select movies. You'll see in here, you have this little trash bin as you hover over these where you're able to dump an entire collection if you want to do that. You can also click into one of these. And now we can view all of these individual documents. You can edit these individual documents. Let me make this a little bit bigger so we can actually see it. You can edit these individual documents here. There's this little edit document button whenever you hover over this. You can trash the entire document if you want to do that, uh, which is what I'm going to do for a couple of these in here. Uh, let me go ahead, delete that. Let's delete this one as well. I'm just kind of deleting some stuff so that our view as we're looking at this is a little bit clearer and so that we understand what's going on. Uh, while I'm doing this, any questions about anything that we've covered here on this index functionality? Uh, yes, Melvin. Just a quick question on like how will deleting data from the database here interact with our VS code? Like what will we have to do to kind of sync the two? Ah, great question. Nothing. Um, so whenever we come back and we refresh this page, everything that I've deleted is now gone. Um, every single time you make these queries, it is they're all pointing at the same database. Uh, so whenever we are uh, making queries here, we're pointed at that database and we're saying, hey, go here, get the data. The data is the same exact data that we are altering on um, Atlas. Uh, Annie, yes. And how is it tracked? Like, for example, if I delete some stuff from my VS code, I can see that there. And how do I track if I delete something from Atlas? Um, when you say delete something from VS Code, what exactly do you mean? Uh, I mean, when we are uh, like making changes to our, our objects of the database that currently you're deleting them, right? So um, how can I see like that someone or like you have deleted the queries from my database from Atlas if I can't see it in VS Code? Gotcha. Um, so if you're... I, I will say probably from this point, we won't really use the Azure extension very much. Um, if this is working for you for some reason, feel free to continue using it. Uh, but uh, for me, the, I know in here, this is not working for me and I know it's not working for many other people. So I don't want to continue like banging our heads against this wall. Um, we'll basically use Atlas to be able to manage all of this stuff here um, from now on. Um, if you, the, the, we'll kind of keep an eye on this and see whenever it is updated because this is a really handy tool to be able to have in our tool belt. Definitely much easier than going over here and having to like, let's delete things manually, like with all of these buttons. Let's like, if I want to edit this and now I have to like come in here and do all of this manual work and this. So we would prefer to use out, um, the Azure extension for sure, um, but this is the thing that works and that is what kind of what we're going to stick with for uh, our needs here. Cool. Good question. All right, any other questions? 
Yes, Nick. Is there any history of what's been deleted? Is there any history? Um, no. Once we have flagged something for deletion and it is deleted, there is no getting it back. Um, in a lot of this is a fun chance to talk about like how production databases work. A lot of things that you will delete from like a big, large application will actually never be deleted. Um, they're essentially kind of just not shown to anyone anywhere, but they, the database will retain all of that information. Um, that would be something like adding a like Boolean to the data that we're tracking here. And this will have something like uh, is deleted or something like that. Um, that is how like many production systems will work. Um, and in that case, what would happen is whenever we query for items from the database, we would simply exclude items that have been deleted. Um, that's not something that we really need to be concerned about at all with the applications that we're building, but that is how many real life applications will work. Um, things that you delete are not actually being deleted. They are still just chilling around with us forever. They're simply hidden from everyone's view. Interesting. Good question. All right. So we have our index functionality built. We have all of our items shown up here. So what we're going to do now is move on to uh, setting up some default uh, values for our items. So this is something that uh, we will need to probably be able to do uh, in some of our applications. We want to have a default release year in this case that is set to the year 2000. It's a very arbitrary choice to just say, hey, all the movies by default are going to be made in the year 2000. Uh, but it is going to kind of demonstrate uh, some uh, things to us as we are working with this data. So therefore, that's what we're going to do. So let's define a default value for a property. Um, and that is going to happen in our model. Um, now that I've done this, actually, let me push this code up. All right, you should be able to pull my code down if you would like. So what we're going to modify here is going to be this release here. You'll see how these are constructed so far. We're just saying, hey, title is a string. Hey, release here is a number. Hey, MPA rating is a string. Hey, cast is an array of strings. Hey, now showing is a Boolean. If I want to make these any more complex than this, what I actually have to turn this into, what we're setting release here to, is into an object. And on this object, I'm going to say that the type of this is a number. And it's going to have a default of the year 2000. So you can see here that we've turned this simple kind of, hey, here's a data type thing into an actual object. And we now have to specify the type, the data type that release here is going to be. And I can actually write all of these things like this, even if I'm not necessarily making them any more complex than they are now. For example, title, say I wanted to come in and turn this into an object to potentially prepare to make this a little bit more complicated in the future, this is what that would look like. I totally do this. Nothing wrong with this at all. Of course, if you have a uh, type that is not really going to be as complex, a field in here that doesn't have any more complexity than this, totally cool to leave it like this. But if we want something more complex, we have to turn it into an object like this. All right. 
again, this is not a practical example. This is probably not something you would do. We'll kind of see an example of something you would do with this here in a moment. But for now, let's go ahead and test this. If I make another movie. Oh, I have EJS on this page. That's awkward. Where is that? Um, that's on my new page. Oh, whoopsies. Just random EJS. All right, cool. So we're on my add movie page. Um, I'm going to add a new movie. Uh, let's not give this a release here. Uh, we'll set APA rating to PG. Cast. We'll do this. This is not showing. Add in this movie. And what you're going to find is that if I swing back to all my movies, this movie does not have a release here. Well, that's not right. We said that a movie should have a default release year of the year 2000. What is happening here? Well, we'll see here. Um, let me get all of our movies here. Perfect. So this is the data that we sent to the server. We have the title is Shrek 2. The release year is nothing. MPA rating is PG. Some cast members. This is the data that we put into our database. And you would think, well, we have a release year as this empty string. We should be using the default value here. That is, unfortunately, not how this is going to work. To be able to use the default value on a thing, it has to simply not exist. We cannot have release year set to anything at all. Release year needs to be undefined for our defaults that we've set on the release year to be able to apply. So how do we make that happen? Well, we have a fun little thing that we can throw into our controller function that is going to check and see, do I have empty strings for any of these values? And if I do, I want to just delete that property entirely. So that's what we're going to write next here in our create controller function. If I come in here and now I say, let us iterate over all of the items in rec.body for let key in rec.body. This is a for loop that iterates over each one of the keys in rec.body. So now showing cast, release year, MPA rating, all of this. We're going to iterate through every single one of them. And we're going to check if the item in that location is set to an empty string. Rec.body, dot whatever key we're looking at, is an empty string. Then delete it. Delete rec dot body square bracket key. So remember, this is some square bracket notation. We've seen this a little bit before back in unit one. This is going to use the value that is held in key. Remember, this is going to be the string of now showing, the string of cast, the string of release year, the string of MPA rating. And it's going to use that in this location. So this is the equivalent of saying, if, for example, say that if key is, uh, ba, 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 let's say, uh, title. Or rather, let's keep it with release here. If key is release here, 
then what this will be is rec dot body dot release here. That is what this that we've written is going to kind of be equivalent to. Now, remember, we're iterating here. So key is going to be all of the different items that we can have on a rec.body. We'll have release here. We'll have now showing. We'll have cast. We'll have all of these things. And we're going to check and see if the item that is held in that location is an empty string then we're going to delete that item off of our object. Then we will delete rec.body.release here. That is what is going on here. Uh, Steven, yes. Why is it that we don't need the curly brackets after the if statement? Is it just because it's automatically just the best the end of that function? Yep. So, we don't so here, this is happening because this is all, this works because this is all happening on the same line. Um, if I wanted to, I could 100% do something like this. No different functional functionality wise. Simply a little bit cleaner in this case to leave it off, but you could totally do this. No problem at all. Uh, Nick. You're right. Multiple uh, conditional uh, conditions like that and have uh, just on the same line? Uh, not on the same line. Uh, so no, I mean, I mean, on subsequent lines, but with the result on the same line. Yep. So we okay. could do something Sweet. like this if we wanted to, for example. Totally valid. Great question. All right, cool. Um, so again, this is one of those very, very similar to this up here. This bang bang rec dot body dot out showing would not seem or would not think that you would kind of come to this conclusion on your own at all. Um, this is one of those things that is one again one of those solved problems. If we need to delete items off of a uh, off of an object. This is how we can do it. If we're checking to see like, hey, is this an empty string? This is how we would go about doing this. Again, solve problem. This code is reusable in all of your controller functions for any time that you want to do something like this. All right. So now what we should see is if I... Go back here and I submit. Uh, it doesn't look like I have access to that data anymore. That is fine. Let's do Shrek 3. Uh, I'm going to now again leave the release here blank. I'm going to add in some cast members, add this movie. Let's go to all of our movies. And now what we'll see is because we have this bit of code that we've added in, our release year is now defaulting to the year 2000, like we would intend it to. So again, big takeaway from this. For a default in your model to be used, this property cannot exist on the object, on rec.body, as you're saving it. A great use of defaults is simply going to be to not include this functionality on the new.ejs. If I don't have this here, what this will do is default all of my movies now to be written and or released in the year 2000. And as an added benefit of this, I don't need to do this work in my create function. If I simply don't provide the user a place to put in something, it is very, very easy to set a default on it. That is what I've done here. I have removed this release here input entirely. 
whenever I do that, then it's definitely not going to be defined as I am creating a new movie. Again, in this case, probably doesn't make a lot of sense to do this, but that is typically kind of what you will see a default be used for. It's just, hey, let's we probably won't receive this data from our user, and whenever we don't, let's make sure that we are providing something there just by default. So just a note on that uh, before we move off of this. Does anyone have any questions about our defaults? Yes, Melvin. I, I kind of an adjacent question. Um, yeah, so yeah, totally. we have a way to set a default, but, and I, I, we might get to this eventually, but is there a way to, to like, uh, impede progress until a value is put in at all? Cause like we could leave it empty and just submit it with no year before this. Right. But can mm -hmm. we make it so that there has to be a value in it to actually add the movie to the list? What a great question. So this is a good time to kind of talk about uh, let's 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 keep this simple for now. If we wanted to do something like that, we could simply add required here. And now this field, we have to put something in here before we are able to submit this form. We cannot submit this form without something in the release here now. So if I try to come here, add a movie, track three again. Uh, now, try to add this movie. Please enter a number. I'm not allowed to submit this form now unless I have provided a number here in this box. Great question. All right. Um, so what we have so far is fine. It's all well and good, but it's not very useful to us. Setting the year 2000 as the default on all of our movies is kind of silly. What might be more beneficial is maybe setting the current year as the release date, as the default release date for our movies. So let's do that. What I could do here back in my movie model, instead of setting the default to just this number here, go ahead, split this object up across lines. I can, instead of just providing a number here, I could provide a function. And what this function is going to do is get us the current year through this line of code, return new date dot get full year. And now this is our default that will be used. And we're going to run this every single time here. Every single time that we get a new movie that doesn't have a release here, we're going to run this function which is going to get us today's full year. So we can see this in action. Um, I'm going to need to turn off my requirement of having this here though. Let's do a quick little refresh. I'm again, not providing a value here. Let's add this movie, swing back to all our movies. And now you could see here is our current year. That is coming from this function right here. Now, something interesting to note. What is the difference between writing this as a function and setting this just to the date, the current year. Let's check it out. Let me add another Is movie. Not no, 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 totally. Take it. 
Yeah, I was gonna say, does it not get invoked if we just send it? That's a yeah, wonderful thought. Yep. So let's do Shrek three again. Again. If I put this in here, swing back to all my movies. This sure looks like it works, right? The reason why we can't do something like this is because this is going to run once whenever we start up this server. When I start up this server, this line of code gets executed. And now what gets returned out of this, 2023, that is the default. We probably wouldn't have this happen today right now, but what happens whenever this runs in the year 2024? If our server is still running in 2024, it won't be, but let's pretend that it is. This is still going to be the default because this line of code was evaluated whenever the server started up. This was invoked now, right now. That is why we want to provide a function here instead. If we provide a function, a function here, this is going to get run every single time that I create a movie. So now this server can continue to run past the new year into 2024 and 2025 and 2026. And every single movie that gets created, we are going to return a new date as of this moment right now, whenever something is being created. That is why we put this into a function. All right, so um, let's see. Any questions about uh, anything that we've done here with our defaults? All right, one little bit here. We are also going to add in some validations on this. Sorry, David, can I ask a quick question? Absolutely, yes. Um. Totally get that we need to define it as a function so that it doesn't just run once. I don't get how it's, why it's getting invoked. Like it, like we're never calling movie.default or anything like that. Like we're not actually setting it, right? I don't get how that function actually runs. Great question. Um, so there's some basically magic that happens here, right? It, whenever we have this assigned as the default here, whenever we say the default is this function. It is going to be evaluated whenever we are requiring a default. So whenever we are missing a release here on a movie that we are creating, this function is just automatically going to run. Mongoose knows that, oh, I need a default for this. Let me go build one for you real quick using this function that you have defined. That is how... Uh, it, this all knows to run. There's a little bit of mongoose magic that is happening here. Great question. Cool. Sorry, is that just because the property is named default or would that happen for any field? That will happen just because this is named default in here. Mongoose knows that, oh, you've provided me a default. I don't have a release here. Let me figure out what this is going to be now that I need to save a release here, a, a movie with a release here into the database. Great question. All right. Um, I'm going to do one quick thing, actually. I missed this earlier, I think, um, because, yes, I need to refactor this redirect because uh, right now I'm going back to the new movies page every time I create a movie, which is really irritating to me. Um, so whenever I create, currently I am redirecting to slash movie slash new, I'm going to instead redirect to just slash movies here on line 21 here in our dot uh, then after we have created a movie. Very small change, but big quality of life difference for us. All right. Um, moving on. 
let's build in some validations. So right now, we've actually kind of touched on this on the front end. If I want to require someone to put in a release here, I can enter required here on our new .ejs. And say, you must enter a release here. I can also define this as being something that is required in our model as well. And this is just going to come from the require property that I can add onto this object. And I can set this as require to true. And now I have to have a release here. I'm actually going to add this up on our title so that we're aligned with the lecture. So again, this is something we did earlier. We changed this from just string to type string. And now I'm going to add required true. So now all of our movies have to have a title. Let me do this just so we're aligned again, just over in our uh, ba -ba -ba, our input as well for our title required. Let me take it off of the release here. So now the user must provide a title, both on the front end and whenever we hit this in the back end, this title. We must provide a title here whenever we are building a movie. Uh, Callum. Um, assuming that the only way to put data into your database is through the front end, why would you need to require it on the back end? Yes, I love this question. So good. If this is the only interface for doing this, this is the only way we have to go about adding a movie. We would think like, okay, cool. If I throw required on this field here, we're good. Everything is happy. We're not going to ever have any issues. And if I don't put in a title here, um, and I submit this movie, I can't do this. Please fill out this field. Well, now that you're developers, you know about this inspector. We've used this quite a bit at this point. If I look in this form, I'm able to see all of the HTML for this. Something I'm also able to do is get rid of stuff. Womp womp. I added a movie. We're doing this not only to protect ourselves from good actors, but also bad actors. This is a huge UX benefit for our user to know that, hey, you need to fill out this field. It's a great protection to have on our front end. Users love that kind of stuff. They want you to tell them that kind of stuff like, oh, we need to have this. We add this in the model to make sure that we have strong integrity in our database. We do this to ensure that even if we have a bad actor that is somehow accessing this and submitting invalid data, that we are still making sure that the data that we are holding in our database has a strong integrity. That is the benefit of all of this. That's why we do this in both locations. One is a UX feature. One is a feature for us, for the people that are building this, that have to make sure that the, da the data for this application is strong. Uh, Daniel. Um, so, so just trying to test the question I'm about to ask, um, but I'm not yeah. quick enough. So if we just have <laughs> the validation on the back end, would yeah. it actually throw an error to the user or would it be invisible to them that something failed? Great question. It is going to be invisible to the user. The user will not see any of your back end errors. Um, we'll kind of in unit three touch on how we would potentially get an error from the back end over to the front end so that the user is able to see all of this stuff. Um, I 
yeah, I believe that's unit three. It's either unit three or unit four uh, where we'll do that. Um, but we, we will touch on that at some point in the future, but that is way too much for what we're doing right now. Um, right now, all we care about is, can I even see the error? That's the important part of this. Um, I do have an issue in here with this. I don't know why I'm getting... Oh, never mind. We're good. So what you'll see here, and because I have protected the back end in the way that I have, because this title was required, even though I submitted this form without a title, uh, what we saw here is a really helpful error once again. Again, very first thing that we see down at the bottom of this, movie validation failed. You submitted some data that wasn't valid. Error, movie validation failed, title, path title is required. Pretty clear what this error is trying to tell us. We have to have something on the title. You've told Mongoose, hey, you've got to have something here. So it's going to validate this before it puts in the database. This title that we lack going into this, this document that we're trying to create, Whenever we have a validation error, this movie will not be created in the database. If I swing over to all movies right now, what you're going to see is that we don't have that movie that we tried to create. Mongoose will stop this from going to the database. It is protecting the integrity of our data. This is, again, huge point of having a model in our application is so that it can do stuff like this. Uh, any questions about this? This one piece of validation that we've got with required. Very good. Um, last thing or last couple things that we're going to add in here. On things that are numbers, such as our release year, we're actually able to specify minimum and maximum values that we can put onto these. So for example, I know that I don't want movies previous to 1927. So I don't have silent movies. So here I can say minimum is 1927. And now if I try to add a movie that was made before 1927 to this database, will not work. It'll fail out. Again, I can duplicate that functionality on my front end as well in this input. You can say that the minimum here is going to be, uh, sorry, minimum is going to be 1927. Again, this validation can exist both on the front end and on the back end. And it's best to have it in both places. All right, so this is how we would do this in our HTML, whereas this is how we would do this in our model. All right, one more last bit of validation, and then we'll go on a quick break. Let's add some validation onto our MPA rating. So here, we're going to need to first start by turning this into an object, set the type to string, and the enum. Into this, we're going to throw a bunch of strings. G, PG, PG13, all of the different valid pieces of data that I could put into this MPA rating. That is what enum is doing. We are enumerating all of the possible values that can go into an MPA rating. We were saying explicitly, the only things that we will allow here are the string of G, the string of PG, the string of PG13, and the string of R. Again, we are enumerating the exact allowed values that an MPA rating can be.
again, kind of to Callum's question earlier, your instinct here might be, well, this is a drop down. We have these four options that we can pick from. Again, at this point, we are cool developers and we know that we are able to come in and say, I wanted to make another one of these. Um, and I can set this. I don't know any other MPA ratings. Don't they have like uh, uh, NC 17? Beautiful. Yeah. I could add an NC 17 movie in here and I could make this an option. NC 17. Perfect. Now I can add, select this from my drop down. I could submit this to my server. But my server is going to reject this data because I have enumerated in my model, I will only accept these four options. So even though I only have my four over here, I as a bad actor could come and do things entirely off the book. That is what this prevents. Kelsey, yes. So, you know, like when uh, there's like drop down menus or ferment, like stuff they have to select to fill out a form or whatever. And like, it's, you know, how did you hear about us or something? And there's like an other option. And then it lets you fill in a field and it like, mm -hmm. you just type in whatever you want. Um, how much more complicated, like, is that code from what we're doing as far as like still having it submit to the database and stuff since we have like a set data structure that it's supposed to be like taking in? Great question. So um, say we wanted to do that. Um, that would not be impossible over here. So we could have like an other option that we could do. Uh, this would simply require adding in. Now we need an other option here. And with a value of other. And then we would need to have some kind of uh, element here. Um, some kind of label. Uh, let's keep this simple. Um, rating. And then I could have an input here. And then this, so how this would work, how I would probably go about building this, um, I would have this be name of potentially like other rating. So now what I have here, oh boy, everything's broken. I love that for us. Um, let's move this out. Cool. Okay. So now what I would prefer to do here is whenever the user has selected other, then I would show this. This would involve some client side JavaScript. Um, I wouldn't want to show this for just any rating because this is confusing, right? Um, so I would want a little bit of JavaScript to be able to show and hide this dependent upon the value of this box that's right here. Uh, but now all I would need to be able to capture this data is another field in our model. I can just come in here and I would say other rating and let's call this a string. And I could now capture this if my user has provided it. That's how you go about potentially doing something like that. Again, the complicated part of this would be let's whenever the user selects an NPA rating over here, if that value is other, then let's show this. That's the that's the complicated part of this, but that is really just some unit one code, honestly. Um when this value is other, show this. Okay. Totally that makes awesome. sense. I was just sort of curious like if there was um anything I guess more to it than just like saying if this is this value then show this if not then don't yeah not really um pretty yeah. um pretty straightforward as far as like how we would potentially go about adding that yeah cool um let me undo a little bit of this work just so that we uh ba -ba 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 -ba. That should fix that, I believe. Oh no. Uh, we need a comma here. All right. So, uh, one last thing in this. Okay. Sorry about that. All right. So, now, 
Um, those are kind of the different types of validation we have. Uh, for strings, you can also set a match. If the string that is provided, uh, you can use a regular expression or regex uh, to be able to match something. Uh, min link and ma max length also exist that will limit the length of the string that is provided. So again, those are things on strings. As for numbers, we've got min and max, which we are using here for the release here, or at least a minimum. All right. I think that's where we're going to leave off for today. Um, so we will pick up on Monday, building out show functionality along with delete and update. Um, these are all things that you have seen before. This is simply going to be another rep of each one of these actions that we take. So this is kind of just going to be a rep of things at this point. Um, you've already seen how to do some show functionality before uh, with your uh, to-dos work uh, and also with skills. You've seen delete as well. The only thing you may have not seen, hello, the only thing you may have not seen is update functionality. Uh, so um, I am going to go ahead and assign to you over this weekend and encourage you to complete it, part one of flights. Um, I know Ben yesterday talked this up as like a huge, hard, like wildly complicated lab. This is a difficult lab, but I personally don't think it's the hardest lab in the course. Just personally, I do think it is a very important lab because this is where you will have a lot of learnings on this stuff and working with it on your own. Um, so I, I do think that this is, even if it is not one of the more difficult labs, it is probably one of the most important labs of this course. Um, and going through and doing this on your own is super, super uh, useful. Uh, so you could see in here, um, a lot of what we were doing is the same kind of stuff that we did today. Um, you're going to create a Mongoose Flights project using eGen replacement. The same, uh, the same kind of template builder that we've been using before. The same thing that you started skills with and the same thing we started to do with. You're going to use that and then hook up a database. You're going to name the database flights. And then you're going to build out your flight model. And then we have some user stories for you to implement. These user stories mirror what we've covered here in lecture. We have a view to list all of the flights. We have a ability to create more flights. We have all of these things that, again, we've kind of covered here today um, with uh, everyone. So um, there are a few bonuses in this as well. I will say these bonuses are related more to time type stuff. I would highly, highly, highly not spend much time on this. Uh, recommend not spending much time on this at all. Um, this is something that realistically, um, if you know you want to kind of uh, play around with this and maybe get some like really uh, base level understanding of how dates are working, this is a decent opportunity to, it makes a little bit of sense in this application because we are dealing with flights um, after all. Uh, so it, it makes a little bit of sense here, but I would probably advise against spending a ton of time on this stuff. Um, the, the more important part of all of this is going to be your actual exercises that are up here, um, building out this functionality. Uh, this is another kind of, uh, this lab builds on itself into next week. So we'll have part two and part three that are assigned on Monday and Tuesday of next week. So um, those items of business out of the way, does anyone have any questions about any of this? Can you push this code real quick? Absolutely, yes. 
Thank you. All right, code is pushed. Uh, so you can see here, whenever you're setting up your model, this is probably one of the most important parts of this activity. There are some validations that are in here and a couple of default values as well. So uh, be kind of cognizant of that as you're going through and doing this lab, uh, this model, super, super important. Um. I think that's going to wrap us up though. Anybody have any questions before we release y'all for the weekend? Very good. Thanks for sticking around with a long Friday lecture. Um, I do have a exit ticket for you all. Um, let me go ahead. I'll throw this in classroom channel for you. Um, same thing goes uh, as before with this. Um, if you are, uh, the, we will probably reach out to you um, regardless of how you do the rest of the survey. If you answer as a one on uh, how comfortable you feel with this, this week's material, just to check in and see how things are going, uh, see if there's anything we can do to help. So expect that if you throw in a one here. Um, and expect us to potentially reach out about any other uh, feedback that you leave, as long as you're not doing that anonymously. Um, and of course, feel free to leave anonymous feedback. Totally cool if you want to do that. Um, all feedback is appreciated, even if it is anonymous, but I obviously can't reach out to you about your feedback if you mark yourself as anonymous. So keep that in mind. Um, let me throw this in the classroom channel for you. Uh, Melvin, yes, question. Just real quick. Uh, the calendar yeah. says TA hours are happening tonight, but that's not accurate, right? It oh, was... no, that's not accurate at all. Okay. Does it say that? Oh, yeah. Super should not say yeah. that. Yeah, it didn't say it for yesterday, which... Obviously. There we go. Yep, 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 yep. Sorry about that. All right. Um. Okay, yeah, we're cool. All right. Um. Anything else? There are TA hours on Sunday, so feel free to hop into those uh, if you get into Sunday and are having issues with this. Uh, but um, I think that is all that I'm going to have for you all today. So uh, feel free to head out. Uh, you're released officially. Um, have a wonderful weekend. Make sure that you take a little bit of a break. Um, go outside, touch some grass, do what Andrew's doing. Just don't do it with a cat because cats are cheating. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Andrew, for demonstrating you working out this morning. All right. Y'all have fun. Have a great weekend. Uh, I'll be around here for the next 13 or so minutes if you want to chat about anything. But bye, guys. Have a reason to chill. Have fun. Thank you. Have a great weekend. Have a good weekend, everybody. Have a good weekend. Bye. Bye. Have fun. David, I can't figure out why that enum um, validation isn't working for me. Oh, it's not working for you? It's not working for me. I, How fun. I've sure, gone sure. over. Uh, okay. Let me know if you can see this okay. I'm sharing my big monitor. Okay, cool. Oops. You're still recording, David. That's cool. We'll record this a little bit. Oh, I'm not sharing anyway. There we go. Um, that looks correct. Um, I'm not seeing a rating at all. Um, oh, on my, I'm not dis. Do I have to display it? For, it, for the validation um, to work? You don't necessarily have to display it for the validation to work, um, but I'm curious why we're not seeing anything in here. Um, could I see your um, yeah, your new .ejs? Uh, the name in here is incorrect. 
Where's my name? This right here. That should be MPA and then uppercase R rating. Uh, no dash. There you go. This should work now. Um, you will need to refresh your page after making refresh. a change. Yep. Okay, cool. Cool. Thanks a lot. Of course, no problem. It's always the little things in unit two. Yes, it is, isn't it? Thank you. Have a good weekend, guys. You too, Dan. Have fun. David, I think I just accidentally made everything look like Netflix, and so now there's no. <laughs> it just oh kept happening. Yeah. <laughs> not a not like a clone way, just the colors are very similar. Add in the dun dun. Ooh, okay. Let yeah, please. Dun -dun. Are we going to be adding update functionality to the movies database next week? Yes, we will. Okay, cool. Because now then I can go in and update my ratings since none of them made their way to the. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I won't do that tonight. Thanks. Probably wise. Yeah. <laughs> Hypothetical. If we were to answer a one <clears throat> and um, you guys were to, you know, talk to us about this would we need to have like some things lined up with like exactly no, 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 what no 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 not at all it'll be very casual just like hey what can we do to help you out like I see. super super cash thanks totes hey ian do you mind uh just hopping into a breakout room with me for like two minutes just going over the feedback that you gave me sure yeah thank you or we can just do it here i guess if there's no breakout rooms Oh yeah, there are no they're sure. not open. Yeah, we can just do it here. Sure. Um, they're open. Have yeah. a good weekend. Okay. Bye Nick. Yeah. Should I share my screen? Yeah, go for it. Why not? Uh, this one. All right, y'all. Take it easy. See you guys Monday. See Have you. Fun. See you Monday. See you, Christian. <laughs> wow, that's hardcore. <laughs> um this is pretty small. Not oh, from Intro to Express, yeah. Yeah, I'm not exactly sure what the bug is. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. So what I was saying is here, you've got student as the from the callback, but do you see how you've got to do here as like a leftover from the previous example we were using? Oh, right, right That's right. all I was trying to say, yeah. Okay, yes. So yeah, if you fix okay. that to student, then everything will totally work. Like the rest of the code you have is fine. It's just one of those things that comes from <laughs> copying stuff. It's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, of course. Anytime. See you guys. Bye. Uh...
Oh. They've been putting siding on my house this week. Yay! Nice. What time, huh? Yeah, only maybe four more months and I'll be back in it. <laughs> so crazy. It only cost me 40 grand <laughs> to get my stuff that was in my house packed out and to store the stuff. That's a racket, let me tell you. Uh, that sounds bad. You should just not. All I can say, insurance, good. I'm never going to complain about it again. Oh, you're still recording, David. <laughs>